All right. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the North Bend City um, Council and North Bend Urban Renewal Agency work session agenda for Monday, April 17th here in the council chambers at 4.30. Um, after calling the meeting to order, we're going to begin with public comment this evening. Um, I did just ask our city recorder, we do not have any public comment online, but we do have two in person. Um, so I'll go ahead and begin with a statement. We always like to make sure we thank everybody for participating in public comment this evening. The public comment period is an essential part of local government meetings. Each person has three minutes to speak, and that's always if you're online or in person to keep it fair and consistent. Um, our governing body does take the input into consideration. However, in, urban, uh, in observance with Oregon open meeting laws, it's not a time for a dialogue, but it's a time for us to listen to you. Our city administrator and city recorder are taking notes of any action if needed. And the first public comment that I have up um, this evening is Larry Ramsdell, senior. Larry, if you wanna come forward, we've got um, a desk up here. I think our city recorder is gonna move the chair and probably pull the recorder just a little bit closer so that people at home can listen and hear you as well. Yeah. All right, and when you're ready, we'll go ahead and begin the three minute timer. So just begin when you're ready. All right, I'm Larry A. Ramsdell, Sr., and I live over on Hamilton, and uh, there was a thing on the uh, uh, web regarding uh, homeless uh, campers, and they were going to use uh, Hamilton as a parking spot for uh, the homeless people. However, uh, I worked two and a half years trying to get them from off, off of Hamilton because they were throwing trash dumping their stores and just on 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 that, that and now there was a suggestion regarding maybe opening Hamilton back up for the homeless on campers and I am totally against that because uh from what I've seen I've been through two or three of the camps that they have around here and every one of them is a total disaster. I mean, there's drugs, uh, there's theft going on, just on and on and on. And myself personally, plus everybody that lives in adjacent to where I live is totally against it. I mean, totally. Uh, matter of fact, some of them even said some things that shouldn't be said, but the fact remains, I feel sorry that people doesn't have a place to live. However, there is work in this town everywhere. If they wanted a job, there's jobs to be found. And there's places to be rented to live in, which they don't, don't want to do. They just want to live on from everybody else and make a mess and let somebody else clean it up. And uh, that's why I'm here today, is I just want to make my comment regarding it that I was very unhappy with the uh, the idea that Hamilton would be a good place for these people to be uh, lodged in. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next public comment is Hannah Kaler. Hello, everyone. Okay. Uh, as Jessica said, I'm Hannah Kaler. Uh, I am here to speak today in opposition to the idea of having uh, the homeless camp along Pinham Loop, um, as you guys discussed at your previous meeting. I have three main reasons for this. Um, so if you would consider, my first reason is that it is designated parkland and that our community has made it very clear that they are extremely opposed to using our parkland in this manner. Um, I'm assuming that the reason you guys would consider this is because it's unimproved parkland, but I just wanted to point out that it's still going to impact the way our parks are used. I'm a mother of two young children with a third on the way. And when my first was a little baby, I used to walk from Ferry Road Park with him over to Simpson Park using a little walking trail that goes along Pitham Loop. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And then one day somebody said, oh, don't you know there's homeless sleeping in the woods there? And now it doesn't seem like a safe thing. And if you guys designate that as an actual homeless camp, no mother and her children are ever going to be able to use that land the same way again. With it being woods, even with it being, you know, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. to 8 a.m., whatever it is, when that time comes for them to leave, there's going to be no way to enforce that because they're going to be in the woods. You're not going to be able to see where they are. 
it's never going to be, nobody is ever going to feel safe walking on the trail again. And our community will lose usable parkland, which is not right. Um, my second reason um, is just fire risk. Now it is a heavily wooded area and studies have shown that homeless camps in woods significantly increase fire risk due to wood stoves and campfires that are used for heat and cooking, especially if, as you guys mentioned at the previous meeting, that this would be used as like the no rules camp, even though you guys have asked for no open flames, that's where they're going to be. And this would be going into effect in July when we're headed into peak fire season, it would be a huge risk. And it would put our community at risk, our, our beautiful, you know, entrance to the city at risk. It, it just, I don't think that's a smart move. Um, my third reason is sanitary. Now, as you discussed, this would be the rule breakers camp. The one can only assume that the drug use is going to be happening at this camp and you can never clean a wooded area, a dirt area, a grass area. You can't make sure all the syringes are picked up. It's never going to be safe for any to, anybody to walk through there ever again. It's never going to be able to be sanitized. Um, and so in closing, I would like to reiterate something actually that Mayor Engelke said at the previous meeting that I think this really needs to be looked at and kept really tight when you guys are first writing this out, because it's going to be so much easier moving forward if you find the need for more camps or more hours, it's going to be so much easier to add them than it's ever going to be to take them away. Um, also, just one last thought of my own is I understand that the reason, my understanding of the reason you guys want this second camp, this B camp, is to, uh, sorry, remove any, um, sorry, blame of the city if somebody were to be injured at Camp A. Um, I would think another idea would be to look at adopting a script, talking to a lawyer to write out something that would be said each time somebody is directed to the camp to say, hey, we have this camp, you're going on your own free will. If you want to stay in city limits, this is where you can be. So thank you for your consideration. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. All right. And that then concludes our public comment for this evening. Um, number three on the work session agenda is the North, the Coos Bay North End Water Board annual report presentation. Ivan, how are you doing? Fine. Good. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Yes. I like the swag here. This is fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank for you anybody so at home who's watching, it says no water, no beer. Use water wisely. Very cute. It's empty, by the way. It is <laughs> just, empty. Just saying. That's <laughs> something about maybe afterwards. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Um, here to present the uh, 2023 uh, manual report and update to the uh, to the city council. And when I start these things off, I I always point to what is our mission statements. It's on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, which is providing reliable and quality service for the present and future needs of our community. That's something that uh, that I truly believe in, and we try to do everything with, with, with that through policy procedures and projects that we complete at the Water Board. Okay, so something else I like to do is kind of give an overview of um, the Water Board. If, if anybody's never heard me present about the water board and how it came to be um, in 1947 the water board or the coos bay water company was purchased from the uh, cities of coos bay and north bend um, to create the coos bay north bend water board um, from that point um, each city said they would um, appoint two uh, two members to represent each city um, as you see, Greg Solers, a longtime board member, um, 35 years or something like that, long, long, long time, been on the water board and recently appointed uh, former council person Bill Richardson um, from the city of North Bend. On the Coos Bay side, um, Carmen Matthews and recently appointed um, Rob Kilmer. So, what is the water board? I, I like to say that the water board is the uh, largest full service water utility on the Oregon coast. And, and that meets the definition of the water board. Um, we do everything from uh, source supply, water quality, water treatment, um, distributing it out through the uh, many miles of distribution pipe, pumps and tanks um, to the home where we read the meter 
um, bill for bill and collect for services, bill for uh, various city services, sewer, um, stormwater, um, public safety fee, North Bend case, water transportation fee, and Coos Base case. Um, we do have our own finance, engineering, and administration divisions. Um, neat thing about engineering is we're able to uh, um, design and build our own in-house projects for water main replacements, um, pump stations, tanks, etc. Um, so, so this is a, a little different way of explaining how the water gets from uh, source supply to the end user. Um, on the top three pictures, you see Upper Pony Creek and Upper Pony Creek Reservoir, the picture on the left, holds about 2 billion gallons of water when it's full. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now it is full. That is a recent mm -hmm. picture on the, on the right, water spilling over the spillway, and that doesn't happen every year. Last time it happened was 2016 mm -hmm. um, when that happened. Um, so right now we're getting all the water that we, we can into the what we call Merritt Lake, which is pictured on the middle left. And Merritt Lake holds 125 million gallons of storage. Um, it's very small in comparison to Upper Pony Creek, but it's a nice buffer to let the water settle out in and, and make it easy to treat at the Pony Creek Water Treatment Plant. Um, this picture of the water treatment plant is taken from the dam on Merritt Lake. It's just a small dam. Um, as you see before, that's where we treat approximately 4 million gallons per day on average. Um, we have the capacity to treat 12 million gallons per day at that plant. Um, and uh, that plant runs every day, 365 days a year. So um, from there, it goes through a various network of 258 miles of water main. Uh, I think we have 33 pump stations, 20 tanks um, to the end user where it um, um, hopefully is meeting everyone's needs for everyday use. So, so jumping into funding and budget, um, water board is 100% funded from uh, water water rates, um, user fees, um, 13,450 customer accounts um, that, that serve approximately 35,000 people. This year's budget is approximately $9.8 million in revenue. That's made up of water sales, timber sales, um, and other various fees, uh, rental properties where we rent to cellular towers on some of our properties and things like that, or, or lease. Um, that's broke up into three main categories. Um, capital improvement program, uh, this year is $2.1 million. I can tell you in 2024, it's going to $2.4 million. That's the plan uh, for this next ju July. Um, we have debt service that we pay. The payments on that's a little over $1.6 million annual, um, broken up into three projects, um, two of which are almost paid off. The Upper Pony Creek Dam reconstruction will be paid off in 2024. Um, allowing us to hopefully do more master planning projects and, and so forth. Um, treatment plant upgrades that were done in 2011 and in a couple of uh, different distribution projects, Bay Crossing and the uh, uh, North Empire Boulevard water main replacement. Um, biggest portion of this is operations and maintenance of what it takes to operate and maintain the operations for treatment, customer service, all those categories we previously talked about at $6.2 million per year. So jumping into recently completed projects, um, if, you, if you see this list, you'll see there's several water main replacement projects, um, diving and inspection cleaning for, for maintenance, a couple of new uh, support systems and fuel and, and phone systems. Um, but I'll talk mainly about two of the projects that we finished. Um, the radar storage reservoir is the top two pictures. Um, you see it there under construction. They're getting ready to enclose the tank so they can blast it and recode it. Um, and of course, the middle one is the finished product. It is recoded inside and out. Um, and it is the last of seven still well reservoirs that we've completed over the last five years with a company called Viola um, for a long in the life. And the nice thing about the Viola program is as long as we stay in the program, if there's something happens to the coding, um, it's infinitely warranted. We just pay the annual fees. So, so they come back and recoat in another 20 years when it's ready to be recoded. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing maintenance cost. So um, the bottom picture is very neat projects that we completed this last year at the water treatment plant, um, which was the replacement of the IMS caps, what we call IMS caps, uh, integral media support caps. 
Um, each one of those little silver to blackish triangles in that picture are um, a media cap. And there's about 80 in each filter. And we have five filters at the water treatment plant. So of course this filter is empty. What these caps do is, is hold the filter media in place. Our filter media that we have is made of anthracite and sand. And um, what basically what was happening is over time, these caps plug up and it puts pressure on the underdrain system below the caps, which you don't see. Here. And, and uh, which is not a good thing because you're only supposed to have a minimum pressure on those underdrain caps. It affects the backwash efficiency of our filters, which we backwash our filters every day after, after we filter the water for so many hours just to make clean drinking water. Um, so we had those replaced and we had to go filter to filter. Um, I think this is the first one. We emptied the filter of the media, replaced the media from the next filter over to this one, and then ultimately bought new filter media for the last one. That project took about two months and about $280,000 final cost. So, so current projects that we're working on, um, we're doing some cathodic protection in actually three different places. I have two here listed, Isthmus Sloop and South Sloop Crossing. We're also doing it at Point Adams in Charleston um, where those um, cathodic protection systems need to be replaced, protects the uh, integrity of steel water mains underneath the sloops. That's what it does, so they don't rust the rest away. Um, we're in the middle of getting ready to uh, advertise for a 2023 timber sale, um, doing some water system masting, master planning that will be done um, with um, Corolla engineers in the next three to four months, we think. Um, um, and then the water meter replacement program and the interactive voice response, and everybody's I'll talk more about here in a minute. But on this slide, we have um, on the top picture, is turbidimeter replacements. Um, throughout our water treatment plant, we need to, we have, per regulatory requirements for Oregon Health Authority, we have to measure the clarity of the water at different places. And we have to meet certain criteria for the Oregon Health Authority to check off in our readings to make sure the drinking water is clear and safe. Um, basically, with the nine that we had um, was installed in the 80s and they no longer make parts for those. So we started three years, years ago replacing these. Uh, the neat thing about this project is these were installed by staff. We just bought the, per the parts. So um, kind of shows to the uh, how talented some of our staff are in building these. And these are all laser, um, they read with a laser in the water, the, clar the clarity of the water. So it's kind of nice to be able to do that. It gives a really specific reading. Um, bottom picture is Bright's Mill Pump Station um, out in the Bright's Mill area. So this, this pump station was installed in, I think, 1978. Um, general life of the pump station is 20 to 30 years. The silver portion of this, you'll see, is a, a custom-built manifold um, supplying three pumps, two service pumps and a fire pump um, in this little box. Um, you can't get parts for this custom-built stuff that's really old. You see some custom-built Band-Aids there on it as well, <laughs> um, where it starts to leak. Um, so this project is a priority for us. We're going to get this done probably in the next three to four months. Um, it's going to the board for design approval um, this week. And then after that, we will get the design and um, replace it with our in-house crews instead of contracting it out. Water meter replacement program. So this is a project that we're currently doing that we identified a few years ago that needed to be done. Um, um, best practices for water meters at, at each resident, um, each business um, look, service location is you should replace them every 15 to 20 years. We've got some water meters in the ground that are 40 plus years old. Um, and what happens with water meters over time is they slow down. And I, I call water meters your cash registers because if they're not accurate, you're not getting all the revenue, you're not measuring the water correctly, it goes to non-revenue water. And so on and so forth. It's just a chain effect. Um, so what we chose to do was start um, taking parts of portion of our capital budget each year and saving money to replace for meters because overall to replace all 13,450 meters, it's about a two and a half to $3 million project. 
Um, so it needs to be done over a certain number of years. And so the, so the water board doesn't have that one upfront cost and then needs to stay that way for, for long term. Um, so what we did was we chose to go with the automated meter reading route. It's kind of a middle of the road option where you drive by and you collect the reads. I can tell you we've done a pilot program of about 860 reads this last year, 860 accounts. Um, it usually was in the worst part of town for reading. Which was the Ingle, Inglewood, up and down hills, and that sort of thing. It took one person three to four days to read that, and now we can read it in about two hours, a little less than two hours. So it's a it's a safety enhancement. But the reader's not out there climbing up and down hills and banks every day. It's uh, they're not you know having to come in contact with dogs and all the hazards that that, that they're have to. It gets them out of the rain in the winter time. Mm-hmm. Makes it much more efficient in the rain. Um, and then we're able to come in and, and do the billings faster too. So it's all we do is download the information and send out the bills a little bit faster. We do have uh, 1,218 of these scheduled in the next two to three months. A contractor is coming in to install um, those in the next cycle um, in the Charleston area. So so we're we're ongoing with 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 this program. So I want to talk about a couple different uh, ways that we're communicating with customers differently um, or, or planning to. Um, right now, this is pretty current. So as of April 1st, um, in addition to a customer getting who becomes eligible for cutoff or non-pay, getting a door hanger, they're also getting a phone call, text message, and email in addition to the door hanger. Um, the idea behind this is to eliminate the door hanger, um, at least 75% or more of the door hangers that we deliver. Um, we deliver on average of about 40 to 50 a day. Um, so it's, it's a huge time commitment for someone to go house to house to deliver 40 or 50 of those a day. There's still uh, multifamily and certain scenarios we will deliver a door hanger in um, for those for those customers. Um, but the customer where the billing and the service address is the same will definitely just be getting a phone call on July 1st for that 48 hour business hour notice for cutoff. Um, on the door hangers, we only actually cut off probably five to 10 a day. So it's, it's significant when we get that notification out there, that drop. So, so this will be a big efficiency. So what we're asking folks to do right now is contact the water board if you don't think we have the current contact information on hand because that's the contact information that we're using for phone, text, and email through our um, new IVR system that we have here. So another way that we're going to start communicating with customers differently, and we've used this a couple of times, is the Everbridge mass notification system. Um, Everbridge is a third-party company who specializes in mass notification for customers for emergency situations. Um, Our Coos County Emergency Management um, has Everbridge um, and uses Everbridge um, for their mass notifications for for fire, for um, different things. And uh, I think Jim's probably familiar with Everbridge a little bit. So so we started using it for um, mass water outages and mass boil notices. So anytime there's a loss in pressure and system, we have to issue a boil notice um, for the Oregon Health Authority. And if that's 250 to 300 homes, which it has been in some cases, that's a lot of door hangers to deliver when you're telling your boil notice. Sometimes we get them there timely. Sometimes we don't get them there timely. And they're like, well, we didn't know. Or we hung it on the back door to the front door. Well, I didn't know to boil the water, that sort of thing. So we're asking people to sign up for Everbridge. Um, they can register. They can download it on their smartphone, which is a Um, Apple and Android supported Everbridge app and register. And when we go in and deliver the the notification, they'll get notified. Um, If they don't have a smartphone, they can Google Coos County Everbridge um, or go to the very complicated web page that I have to put on here. It's easier to Google Coos County Everbridge. Um, And we, like I said, we have used this a couple of times pretty successfully. So it's, it's, it's a big, big savings for us time-wise for boil notices and gets that instant notification out there. 
Okay, so future projects. Um, we are planning on replacing the Wisconsin pump station. Uh, this is a, a, a large pump station um, out of North Empire Boulevard in Wisconsin, um, feeds the Charleston area. Um, really important to the community because it feeds our fisheries and a, and a large part of the, um, a large amount of water that goes to Charleston on a daily basis for fisheries and cleaning and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the water meter replacement program is gonna be ongoing in the future. We have uh, several water main replacements that we're getting ready to uh, to do this uh, this next summer, um, maybe in the next summer on a couple of those. Um, our water treatment plant needs a new roof. And along with that, we're going to do some security updates to doors and gates, put some automated doors and gates in. Um, we're going to do a rate and systems development charge study. Um, it's been overdue. And we're waiting on the uh, finalization of our master plan. Uh, to be able to make sure that we have all the CIP information moving forward, put in the rate study, and so we have uh, can do that strategically long term. And there's more coming. Um, it's, that's not listed here, but um, if anybody has any questions, glad to answer. All right. Any questions from the counselors? I would, yes, that's an order. How many pump stations are there throughout the system? I'm just curious. I think we have 33. Okay, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. And did it used to be the case? I, I had to replace my water main, which was thin wall black PVC held together with five splices. Mm -hmm. Turns out that that's what I inherited when I bought the place. And one of them busted, and I had a stream running out of my front bank. And the utility came in, shut off the meter, but eventually they gave me a new meter. They shut the valve, gave me a new meter. And do most um, residential properties have both, you know, an inlet valve and an outlet valve, or is it just one valve? Because in my case, it was just one. Um, I'll, at the meter, it's typically just one. There's just one? Yeah. Okay. I got lucky then. I got a second one. So I could... Yeah repair my system, they mm -hmm. turn theirs on, I could keep mine closed, turn it on, check for leaks, and then if I had a leak, I could close yeah. it again. No, the water board owns and, owns and maintains mm -hmm. one at each service yeah. location. Yeah. And are there any, I know um, Matt, Matt Witte came and gave the professional engineers of Oregon, he gave a talk and explained kind of what the scenario would be if we had a Mag 9 quake. Mm -hmm. And is there, in, in the master plan, are, are there any, um, any plans that address that kind of thing? Like yes. Yeah. One, one of the requirements that the um, Oregon Health Authority requires of all master plans to be done is a seismic piece for master planning. It doesn't design your um, master plan for seismic ability or resilience, but it does have uh, well, it does relate to the Oregon Resilience Plan, which is the 50 year plan for utilities to to put in place and upgrade pieces of critical pieces of infrastructure that needs to be done. Thank you. And Thank you. Councillor Jones had a question. Yeah, I did. So um, for the, when you're reading the meters um, from the distance, I suppose, the smart mm -hmm. meters, um, how can you tell if the meter isn't working properly? How can you tell? Yeah. So, so there's lots of bells and whistles with this new, software and it, so it gives you um one it tells you if there's been a, a zero consumption um right there on the spot it tells you if there's been a, a backflow instance during that billing period um we can actually get data on troubled meters down to the out i want to say maybe down to the minute for 90 days so consumption. So if it, it throws red flags at you for all different scenarios. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know them all, but I know enough to say, hey, backflow, leak detection. Um, if if there's a high amount of water for a customer who may have a leak, it's going to tell us that. It's going to tell us if it's stopped, um, so I, on and so forth. I was just curious about um, not so much what it can tell you about the residents, but it's real simple things like, is it the right residence or is that meter not working for that resident? So yes. Yeah. It, 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 any people look double yeah, it's it, everything's everything's done by serial number. Mm -hmm. So by address and serial number. So just like 
anytime we do a meter change now without the software, we just we make sure we have the right serial numbers for the right addresses. And then that just transfers right into that system and software to bill for that address. Yeah. Well, I think this annual report is tactical of really great information. If it is. just the regular residents want to view it, they can just go online and see it. Yes. That's what I was going to add the annual report and the yeah. consumer confidence report that we have to report to oh. Oregon Health Authority annually is on the website, yes. which is www.cbnbh2o.com. Great trivia in here. And right. so ask one question. One one question, then we're gonna to go to my trivia question. Oh, you got a trivia question? Yeah, but go ahead. Well, it'll probably not be my question. Okay. <laughs> just uh, just curious on on since the paper mill's been gone on the spit for quite a few years, mm -hmm. how much how much do you guys take out of the sand? How much do we take out of the raw water for sand yeah. We right now and for a long time now, it's been half a million gallons a day. Huh. And that's just to make when the paper mill was there, you were a couple three million gallons. Yeah, or more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And speaking of gallons, Very without good. looking at this, how many for those you don't get to answer this oh, one, okay. but anybody else seeing that? How many gallons? So it says the average residential, the average average residential customer uses blank gallons of waters water monthly. What is the average? Yeah, don't look, or if you want to answer, what do you guys think? Anybody in the in the gallery here? How much do you think, how many gallons do you think the average residents? So I mean, the way this is worded, was that household or person? Household. household. So, so the average household, how many gallons do you think you use a day? I just want really to answer. Don't look, yeah. We, uh, Captain Mitz there, you got a guess? Yeah, <laughs> gallons. I have to do some math. It's 150 yeah. times 30. I would say 100. 100 gallons? <laughs> so you were wrong. Only time I'll tell one of the police that they're wrong is the average residential customer okay. uses 4,077 gallons of water. Oh, wait, monthly. monthly. You said daily. Monthly. Monthly. I, I, I screwed up my own trivia question. <laughs> so a month. Yep. Yeah, a the month average year. residence uses 4,000 gallons a month. Yes. It's a lot of water. That's yes. nice. Thank you for making sure that well, it's healthy for yeah, us. Was, yeah, you were close. He wasn't wrong. Yeah. When you do an estimate, it's about <laughs> 150 gallons a day. For yeah. <laughs> Very yes. good. So um, thank you for thank all the you. information. Thank you for yeah. working hard to keep us all okay, safe with safe water. It's very important. Presentation. I think if you bring a thumb driver. Okay. There's a book out there called Centurions, and it's about how do you how do you live to be 100, right? Because I just came up to 50, so I need to live another 50 years. And there's three common things that ever bit that you that they find in people who can live to be 100. And um, one of them is a sense of purpose. Um, and the other is uh, access to clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what the third is. So we could just make it up. Like, yeah, make yeah. Sure. Eat, eat, food. Yeah. Whole yeah. foods. Eat, 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 eat but purple I'm stuff. for that about access to clean drinking water is very important. Yeah, it's eat purple stuff. Okay. All right. Well, um, we'll go ahead and move on to the fourth item on the agenda, which is Coos County Coordinated Office of Homelessness Strategic Plan Presentation. Uh, we have some information in our packet on page um. Well, it says pages one through 38. And then I believe we have some speakers tonight, correct? Yep. yep All right. Enough. Would this be the time to introduce former Coos Bay counselor, uh, Jennifer Groth, um, who is now here um, in a different capacity? So I will let you explain your role. Well, thank you, Mayor Engelke. Uh, my name is Jennifer Groth. I am with Rural Development Initiatives. We're a nonprofit organization that specializes in helping communities with community engagement and um, community development. And we were asked to help with the um, work related to House Bill 4123 that uh, provides a million dollars for eight pilot communities across the state to help them coordinate the services that they provide to the unhoused and also helps to provide pathways to housing. So what I thought I would do today is sort of explain a little bit about how this draft came together and then talk about how it is organized and then answer any questions that you have. It is not my intention to read this to you today. Um, I also want to make sure that I introduced Andrew Brainerd. You may have taken a call. He ran away. Uh, Andrew has recently been selected as the coordinator for the Coos County Coordinated Office or director for the Coos County Coordinated Office on Houselessness. And he is new to the position. So we'll give him a little bit of a pass today, but I'm glad mm -hmm. he's here to um, help us with this presentation. 
Um, as you know, we also have an advisory group that's sort of organizing this effort that includes two representatives from the city of North Bend, two from the city of Coos Bay, and two from Coos County. The North Bend representatives are Mayor Engelke and um, the city administrator, David Miller. So they have been involved in this project as well. So um, the document is organized in a way that includes a sort of executive summary at the beginning. Um, the introduction sort of explains how we brought people together and also talks about how many people were involved. So the Coos County Coordinated Office on Houselessness has been created, which was part of the requirements of House Bill 4123, and it has been staffed. Um, we also interviewed or had meetings with over 60 people that we would describe as stakeholders. And those were defined in the statute as well but they include people who are experiencing houselessness. They include people who provide services to the unhoused, and they include people who are looking at pathways to permanent housing and creating more housing stock for the region. So we did a series of interviews um, in person and virtually. We also convened two workshops of these groups to try to get some consensus together. We did the, the famous DOT technique to try to figure out what the priorities were. Additionally, we implemented a community survey and we have oh, about 200 people who responded to date to try to figure out what the attitudes and impressions were around housing and homelessness in the region. As part of our workshops, we asked the group to pull together a community vision and you can see on page one what that vision is. I will go ahead and read that out loud because I think it's probably helpful to the, to the presentation today. The residents of Coos County will work together to address the root causes of houselessness, understand and support the struggles of our neighbors, and build pathways to ensure the region can provide stable, affordable housing and every resident can contribute to a proud community and prosperous economy. So that represents sort of a goal statement for the project. The uh, House Bill 4123 requires a strategic plan be created. It requires that the plan be turned into the Oregon legislature by May 23rd. As a result, the timeline is pretty tight <laughs> for this thing. Um, and so we're pretty proud of the way everybody has come together in the community and contributed to this effort. And we think this document has a lot of great information that will be helpful in the five years going forward. So on page two of the document, you can see that there are um, eight priorities that, that were the result of the workshops and the DOT statements, and I'll go into those in a little bit more detail in the um, plan, and I will name them at that point. But I just wanted to explain that the first two pages of this document are sort of an executive summary. Uh, page three, when we talked to all of these stakeholders that we described earlier, there were some things that kept coming out every time we talked to people, you know, there's common themes, and we wanted to make sure we put those at the beginning of the document. So as you can see, there was an expressed desire for additional beds across the housing spectrum. Um, there is a feeling that services to the unhoused population are actually reasonably well coordinated. That's not to say that they're perfect, but people do talk to each other. That is one of the benefits of, of being in the smaller community is that you know everybody and there can be informal relationships and people talk to each other. They want to create more formal structures, but there are informal structures in place. Um, there is a disconnect between those that are providing services to the community and the broader population um, in terms of an understanding of what's already been provided. One of the things that really stood out to us when we did this work is that there's so much already happening. We don't have to start from scratch. We can build on what's working and maybe make some tweaks around the edges, so to speak. Um, we do recognize that that, the, that that disconnect may mean that the community needs to be more engaged as part of the solution. Um, someone had a quote, turning frustration into curiosity that I thought resonated well. So I, we included that in here. Um, we also wanted to recognize that there are a lot of different entities outside of what you would consider the traditional social service agencies that are working on this problem. And there's a laundry list you can see on page three that include public works departments, parks departments, police and fire, libraries, schools, foster care providers, and faith-based organizations. So there are a lot of different types of groups in the community working on this, not just the traditional so social service agencies that you would think. Um, 
Local leaders and service providers want better pathways to ensure that their stories, barriers, and resource gap are communicated to statewide leaders. As we all know from what we've been reading in the news, at the federal and state level, there are a tremendous amount of attention being devoted to this issue. And in, and in addition to that, there are a tremendous amount of resources that are being devoted to this issue, whether that be expertise or funding. As a result, um, we think that the elected officials of the region have done a great job of sort of trying to elucidate and talk about the things that are happening in this community as a way to demonstrate what the needs are, but we think it's important that those connections continue to be developed and remain strong so that the people at the state and federal level who we um, who are our representatives understand what the problems are, but also are aware of the, them being aware of those problems means that they know when a solution or a funding source comes up, they know who to contact and they know that you have a need. Uh, a lot of people mentioned that, that there seems to be some a lot of efforts to develop housing in the region, but those seem to be somewhat separate from the um, efforts to address homelessness and that there might be some benefit to connecting those two a little bit better. Uh, a lot of people mentioned that, um, that this problem will not be solved without robust substance abuse and mental health services alongside housing, which I think um, we, could, we saw a real consensus on that issue. Uh, the other thing we heard from people who provide services to the to homeless people is that they need to be tailored to specific sectors of the population. There's different needs depending on the sector that you're working with. Um, families with children, senior citizens, disabled people on fixed incomes, veterans, youth exiting the fo uh, foster care system, and people who we defined as, as chronically homeless. So um, we also noticed that a lot of the services to the for the unhoused population are concentrated in the Coos Bay North Bend area of the county, um, and that the legal services that for that population are in Coquille. Um, and so that's just an observation. So the next thing that we have in the document is the community survey results. So these were all mostly open-ended questions, and we had a um, an outfit named Zen City who does analysis, who does data surveying and analysis sort of own this particular part of the plan. And you can just uh, look through and see what some of the um, answers to the questions predominantly were. And we also included some quotes that we pulled from the surveys just for your own information, but we have all the raw data if for some reason you're feeling ambitious and you wanna look through. Uh, so what does homelessness look like in your community? The, the top response was living on people living on streets and camping on streets. Um, the When we talk about the fact that there's a disconnect between the services that are being provided and the fact that, you know, that the community sees a problem and they don't know how it's being solved really um, came through in the second survey question, which is what do you think is working well in, the, in addressing these issues? And the top response was nothing. So that, that seems like an opportunity to do some um, communicating. Um, how can the region improve its approach to dealing with homelessness? Um, there's a variety of different answers without a lot standing out, but affordable housing, shelters, law enforcement, designating space to the homeless, and drug and substance abuse treatment. So on page eight, you can see that we talked about um, one of the things that came through, when we, especially when we talked to the advisory group about this, is we wanted to make sure we were defining the actual problems that we were trying to solve, because you... The idea of saying we're going to solve homelessness makes it sound hard. Not that it's not, but it makes it sound untenable and not specific. And so we looked at some of the specific issues that people were talking about relative to this problem. Um, do we understand the demographics of who is unhoused? That seems like an important step to identifying what the problem is we're trying to solve. Do we have good sources of data that tell us who is unhoused or what are the struggles they're having? Um, is there a link between uh, crime and homelessness, and what is that link? Um, there was also a discussion of Measure 110, which is the uh, recent uh, measure that decriminalized some um, substance. How do we say that? Re decriminalized the use of some drugs, um, but also provided a tremendous amount of resources towards substance abuse um, treatment. Um, so that's a little bit of a double-edged sword, and there's a lot being talked about in the Oregon legislature now about how to tweak Measure 110 to make it more useful for communities. Uh, many of the stakeholders talked to us about wanting to know what the root causes were for homelessness, particularly the economic factors, and being able to know that would help as a community to move forward um, and understand how we can reduce the problem or keep it from 
growing into what it's become right now. Uh, obviously, duplication of services needs to be addressed. And then again, I'm, I apologize, I'm going to keep saying this over and over, the broader community needs to become more aware of and engage in the effort to address houselessness and support pathways to permanent housing. So then we, then we have the bulk of the document. So this is sort of the, on, on page 10 is sort of the results of what everybody said was the priorities in the community that they wanted to solve. And what we did for each pr priority is we thought it was really important to list what's already being done or what's already been accomplished because a lot has already, you know, is already in the works or has been accomplished. So each one of these priorities is divided up into what's been accomplished already, um, some things that the, ident the stakeholders identified as short-term actions that, that, that we could do in the next year or so, things that are, we're going to have to plan for in the long term, like more of a five-year time frame, um, understanding the resources that are available to pay for these things if we want to do them, and then how we're going to measure success. So each one of these is divided up into that. And like I said, I'm not going to belabor you with all of the details, but I wanted to explain that that's how the document is organized. So the first thing that was identified as probably the highest priority was improving coordination of housing and houselessness services among agencies and jurisdictions. This is actually what is required by House Bill 4123, and it also came up as the highest priority in the community, so we're all on the same page. Uh, the second priority that came up was developing pathways to supported permanent housing and increasing workforce housing. And that, again, is was mentioned in the House Bill, and you guys think it's one of the top priorities, so this all make this is this all makes sense. The third priority was again increasing community understanding of the housing shortage and services to the unhoused, and this is a result of the stakeholder meetings and the community surveys results and the the fact that our stakeholder wor workshop everybody voted and this was the one of the top priorities was to help uh, increase communication. On page 15, the fourth priority was to explore the root causes of houselessness and the economic impact on the lack of affordable housing. So this is an opportunity for us to perhaps develop some local economic indicators, do an analysis of where we think the problem is, and act on that basis. Um, on page 16, the fifth priority was to address broader community concerns about public safety and trash accumulation. And I think that this really came from the community survey results where we heard loud and clear that those are the things people see um, and experience about homelessness in their community. Um, and so we had some ideas about, you know, things that have already been accomplished and things that could be done in the future. On page 18, we have number six, which is to improve mental health and substance abuse services. We learned a lot from the folks in the community that we talked to that provide these services. And they had a lot of really um, great suggestions about what we could, what we could do going forward. Um, and then on page 19, as we already mentioned, one of the priorities was that um, that community leaders, elected leaders need to advocate for the community, community needs related to housing and homelessness at the state and federal level. And that has already been happening, but we had some ideas of how that might be um, continue, the relationship could be um, continually improved. This is about, um, if you'll pardon me, a Hamilton reference, being in the room where it happens. Uh, so, and then uh, number eight um, is identify and address racial disparities and providing equitable pathways to permanent housing. This issue didn't come up too much in our conversations. This is part of this, the House bill requirement when, when the community does their annual reporting on their progress um, and what we're doing with the funding that we receive. This is one of the questions that, we, that has to be answered is how we're addressing racial disparities in housing. So we, we provided some suggestions about how the community might do that. So page 22, Oof. We, uh, the, the, the statute required that the plan include uh, national models and how those might be used to address the, the issue that you see before us in this local community. Um, we contracted with someone who has a lot of experience with national models. We are not housing and homelessness experts, so we contracted with somebody to ask them about what is what are net typical national models, what is being used. So that's what we've outlined in these pages. Um, he did say, he said, you know, a national model is a national model. He says you can, and I know we all know this from our own work, you can pull little bits and pieces that sound like they will work for your community, and that's the benefit of using a national model as opposed to maybe taking the whole thing and just plugging plug and play, so to speak. 
Um, and then on 24, page 24 is a glossary of terms, which you know I, I learned a lot of acronyms <laughs> in creating this. And, and so we thought we should include some of those as well. So that's, that's a few pages of the document. And then uh, page 28 is the advisory group members, which we already talked about. Uh, page 29 is where we have the um, stakeholder group members. So you can see all of the people who participated either as interviewees or participants in the stakeholder workshop. Uh, one of the things I want to point out, particularly on page 32, is one thing that we hadn't talked about because it wasn't part of the requirements from the state in terms of how we create this plan um, is faith-based organizations. But we were fortunate to have a volunteer, uh, Bar Barb Milliron, who came to us and said, I want to help. I'm passionate about this issue. And so she volunteered her time, and I wanted to make sure to acknowledge that as part of this plan. She interviewed 23 churches. Um, which is a tremendous amount of work. So I want to make sure to give her credit for that. And there's a summary of what she learned on page 32, but also some of the uh, people that she talked to joined us in the stakeholder workshops um, and were part of that conversation, which was really great. And then um, some of the things that they suggested and their priority, their prioritization of what they thought was important for the community is included in the main document. Um, on page 33, if this is just some resources we found along the way that we thought we might be helpful going forward, some of the bills that we know that are going through the Oregon legislature or that the federal government is working on related to housing and homelessness that might provide some funding or assistance to the community. Um, I will say there were over 80 bills that I could count that have been in introduced into the Oregon legislature this session about housing and homelessness, so they are not all here. Um, but, but certainly, we tried to pull out the ones that we thought would be most interesting to, to the community. There's also some technical assistance resources um, that are listed. And I will mention that one of the things we're working on is the Oregon uh, Department of Housing and Community Services, which is the Oregon State Housing Authority. Um, they have a form that the community can fill out that's, that indicates what kind of assistance you need uh, and technical assistance, like do you need help with grant writing? Do you need help understanding how to, how to build affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. And they have um, contracted with subject matter experts that can help the community on um, provide expertise on certain topics. So um, we're working on that, getting that filled out so that, that those resources can be available to the community. The other thing that was required as part of the statute and also makes a heck of a lot of sense um, is, is identifying resources like grant funding and other types of money that would be available to implement some of this. So in addition to the list that we have made under each goal, that identifies housing fund, housing and homelessness resources that are available to meet those goals. We also just gave you the whole laundry list at the end. And I apologize, it's impossible to read this thing. Uh, but it's uh, it does exist and, I, and you can't make it bigger <laughs> um, so that you can read it. But we wanted to make sure that we gave you even those sources that may not directly apply to some of these goals, but that may be helpful in the future. I didn't think it would take me this long to go through it, but I guess it's a long document and I um, would welcome any questions. I think, and I may need some direction from the advisory group members in the room, but I think that what we need to do as part of our process here is we are going to both city councils. So tomorrow night, we're going to talk to the Coos Bay City Council. Tonight, we're talking to the North Bend City Council. Tomorrow morning, we're talking to the Coos County Commission and we're presenting the same information and we, um, need to, before we can submit this to the state on May 23rd, we need to get approval from all of those bodies in order to, in order to submit this plan. All right, thank you. So Ooh. I'm sure we have probably a couple questions and I don't know if Andrew Brainerd wants to join us up here too, to see if any of the council has any oh, questions Lord. for him. Please come forward. Um, I think um, you did an incredible job of summarizing yeah. months worth of work and yeah. research and data and coordination. Um, and, um, and so the process now um, is for us, we're going to be digesting this, probably won't have all of, you know, you're not, you're going to want to read through this um, in its entirety, but ask a few questions tonight if you have them. And then it's, we, what's the date line then here? You're going to be asked to uh, formally adopt it as a council tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that if that doesn't happen, that there's enough bandwidth time 
uh, to reconcile any differences between the three governing bodies uh, so that it can then be presented uh, on time uh, to the legislature. So questions from the council on the strategic plan? Yes, Councilman Rowe. I was just wondering if I've heard of some nonprofits setting up a system where people who are homeless can, can have an address and have any mail, any, you know, that they have a place to go to pick up their mail, you know, and they can tell whatever, if maybe they have a veteran. So Councilor Nora, for, for example, the Devereaux yes. Center does something like that already. Is, um, is, yeah. Has that been identified as a need that... It's so that's something that's already happening with the, the Devereaux Center right, does. Sure. Yeah, we do that. Yeah, so know. if we just for time, just because we think just 7 p.m. is when the next meeting's in this office and we still have to go over the camping ordinance. So if there's anything, I think we all have, I don't mean to cut you off, and I think we all have some really great ideas, but I just want to make mention that that is a service okay, that the good. Devereaux Center is happening already. Um, so I don't want to turn this into a conversation about ideas that we think we have to solve the problem. Um, but what ideas do you have about this strategic, um, this the Coos County Coordinated Office of Homelessness strategic plan? Um, because we will be reading this tonight in detail, um, if you haven't already, and then adopting that tomorrow night. So I kind of want to focus it in a little bit about this document here, if that makes sense. Yeah, I do have another yes. question. I saw and I, I missed my computer kind of died on me and I missed taking part in the CCAT. There was there was a workshop online workshop. There was it was a Zoom meeting, I believe. Do you can you brief us on what came out of that? And they were looking at expanding their routes. And I think it was a to an eye to giving the homeless some some transportation help. So is that was that something in the strategic plan here? Well, honestly, what I can say about that is that we we she was one of our partners in creating this and she did send me a note that said, did you know this meeting is happening? And so we distributed notice of that meeting to the stakeholder group okay. because it had been uh, brought out as a concern as part of our process to say we need more we need more routes, we need, you know, we need more okay. robust service. And so I'm I unfortunately didn't attend the CCAP meeting. I don't know if, if somebody, if Andrew or somebody else did. I don't think Andrew was I'm there I, yet. I did have a meeting with the director in discussions of for the future plans and for especially for the overnight stays and transportation. And she is willing to work um, with the advisory board and myself once we get to that point of location. And uh, she has updated her website to the locations easier to read to find out where the stops are as well. So we are in talks with her about the discussions of possibilities for sure. Yeah. So again, kind of focusing it on on the stock here. Remember here that um, that this came out of a house bill um, which identified we are one of eight pilot regions around the state to receive money to coordinate the response to homelessness. Um, in um, Coos Bay, North Bend, and, the, and the, the whole county here. And then what Mr. Brainer was hired to do is to be the Office of Coordination for that. And so really what the kind of like where we're at right now is talking about like this document and moving it. Um, and then there'll be lots of pieces of how to move that forward. Yes. Um, so is there any questions about like this document? So what I, so... My question is basically, is there a feedback loop? Well, I'm sure there is. I'd just love to hear two minutes of it. A feedback loop for when we find out about our homeless populations. Um, and, the, and the critical element I'm thinking about is um, uh, around drug use and around how much of it is prescription drugs and about how much of that is a dumping ground for corporations coming to rural communities, much like ours with their excess. So so that so so not that particular thing. Do you think that's thing, going to be answered in two minutes? Not that particular thing. But I'm curious <laughs> about the feedback and back up. So when we find out about what's happening with our people on the ground, do we have any feedback loops up about things like that situation, which which we know is happening. So that that's what I'm curious about. The feedback loop back up of I, what's happening. I'm not so let me ask is I see Andrew is, is crinkling his brow and if he, I'm not sure I don't want to put words right. in your mouth but he's like I'm not sure I understand the question but I can give you an example so yeah, that's okay that's great I think this might be a really helpful example is um one of the roles I believe that you'll be 
um, doing is again, working with people who are already providing services. Right. And there was an, actually, I had a meeting um, earlier this week with a deacon of one of the churches and Andrew was at the table and had, and the person had mentioned that we have people camping in our, you know, back of our church. And Andrew's right, right away was like, here's my number. I, you know, this is one of the roles that I can play is I can make sure, you know, our um, officer Dunning um, could be in touch with that person and connect them to services. So I think, is that kind of answer some of your question? Like that would be part of what that role is. There are a lot of these services are happening and it had never been coordinated before. Yeah. People weren't talking to each other. So I think that will, the feedback loop will probably be part of, am I on the yes. right track here, yes. you think? Well, in the feedback loop that I'm thinking of in particular is for influencing future legislation at a higher level than us. So, and they, you can't really do that with no feedback. So that, so that's right. So, for, so the, the, when we mentioned that there's a goal that says there, there needs to continued advocacy with state yes. and federal legislatures, then, that's, I, what then that's what I mean by that. In right. other words, there has to be an opportunity for local elected officials to say to their state reps or their, you know, U.S. senator. Here is the problem that we're seeing on the ground. Yes. We've been able, we've had some funding to help us better identify what that is, identify what we think the solutions are, and we can communicate those in a way where that if they know of available resources Terrific. or or if they think that changes need to be made to legislation, then that can be something that the community can help advocate for. Terrific. Yeah. yeah. Like we have a strong advisory board and then uh representing North Bank Peace Bay. So probably minutes when I was already, I had a quick phone call, but also, Commissioner John Sweets on that board as well, and so he can connect. And um, Madam Mayor and our city manager can connect. We have great relations with Boomer Wright and David Brock That's Smith. Terrific. So there's yeah, strong exactly communication right that can get back. Um, because and, we and, know and the problems bigger than right. So yeah. some of the work. So if we can't sort of funnel up. Yeah. So for example, on the Oregon Mayors Association, I'm on a task force for yes. the homelessness yes. um, response for the state of Oregon. Yes. And the OMA, Oregon Mayors Association, put in a legislative ask of funding and saying, you're gonna keep telling us we have to do all these things, we need to have some funding for it. So yes. like it comes through yes. a couple different. Yes, no, that's that's exactly what I was looking okay. for. Thank you so much. So I know that you guys have had um, have, have had the packet for a little, a little bit now, but um, I would, if there's any questions that come up tonight or in the morning or before we um, vote on adopting this tomorrow, um, what would be the best way is direct our questions to our city administrator? Yeah. And you can funnel them to. I can't answer it. I know how to get an answer. You know, yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that helpful? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. terrific. This is, yes. Yes. I was going to say we're, you know, we, it took us decades to get here and hopefully it won't take us decades to fix the situation. But I think having a coordinated response could help. Absolutely. Is where, yeah. where I see it. Yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah. I will be in attendance tomorrow night as well. So and then, yes. If you have any questions that follow up during the evening time. So. Great. All right. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Okay. Thanks, so Jennifer. Thank you, Andrew. Make highlights together on that yeah. and ask any questions. Send them to our city administrator. Um, okay. Next up is number five on the agenda. I see our finance director coming on up and going to speak to us about our city and URA audit report presentations. We have two packets on this, one for the URA and one for the city. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I'm here tonight to um, introduce our auditors who are here to discuss the results of our fiscal year 2022 audits for the city of North Bend and the North Bend Urban Renewal Agency. Right. Um, we have uh, Tara Camp, who is joining us virtually this evening. Um, to discuss with you the uh, audits. And Tara, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Great, great. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you and um, I will go ahead and distribute bound copies uh, um, to the council. So go ahead. Sounds great. Good evening, Madam Mayor and fellow council members. Thank you for having me here this evening. My name is Tara Camp. I'm a partner with Polly Rogers and Company, and we are the financial statement auditors for the city of North Bend and the Urban Renewal Agency. So I am here this evening to present the results of the June 30, 2022 audits. And what I will do is go over our governing body letter, 
those are letters are nice summaries of everything we're required to communicate with you. And I can take any questions you have along the way about the audit process or after it's perfectly fine either way. Okay. So for both the city <clears throat> and the urban renewal agency, <clears throat> excuse me, the purpose of the audit is twofold. We perform the financial statement audit. That is where we test and assess the financial statements created by management in order to determine if they're fairly stated. And we also perform the Oregon Municipal Audit Law, Oregon Minimum Standards Procedures. And those are compliance procedures where we look at various ORSs to ensure the city's in compliance. So the results for the audit for the city are for the financial statement audit, we issued an unmodified opinion on the basic financial statements. That means we gave a clean opinion with no reservations. So that's very good. That's exactly what you're going for. And our results for the financial statement audit for the Urban Renewal Agency are the same as well. The URA also received an unmodified clean opinion. For the city, for state minimum standards, we found some exceptions requiring comment as noted on page 86 of the report. And we also issued a separate management letter dated April 12th, which is the same date as the auto report, detailing material weaknesses and in internal control. Other things that we communicate with you are the city implemented a new accounting standard for the year ending June 30, 2022. It's called GASB 87 leases. It's one of the biggest changes to governmental accounting in many years, and they did excellent with that. We encountered no significant difficulties in performing and completing our audit. The city is always professional and really great to work with and um, provided us everything we needed. We had no disagreements with management regarding financial accounting, reporting, or other items. And then lastly, um, page four and five of our governing body letter summarizes various accounting standards that are coming out in the future. There's always new ones coming up. And so those are good things to be aware of because they can change some things in the report and they can also require additional work of the finance staff. So overall, those are the results. Um, does anyone have any questions on the specifics? No questions so far from the council. Okay. No questions so far. Okay. Does the um, council need to accept? Uh, that would be tomorrow if it's on the agenda. Um, we uh, would then get through the URA if there's no questions yeah. on the audit. Does that conclude your um, summary of the audit for the city? And would you like to move on to the URA audit? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Great. So as I discussed before, the purpose of the audit is the same for the city. We perform the financial statement audit and the Oregon minimum standards compliance audit. And for the urban renewal agency, we issued an unmodified opinion on the basic financial statements. For the Oregon minimum standards, we found no exceptions or issuing issues requiring comment. And for the urban renewal agency, we also issued a separate management letter detailing a material weakness in internal control. So, for the URA, the same results apply. We encountered no significant difficulties in performing and completing our audit. And we had no disagreements about accounting reporting items. And, um, and then lastly, again, in that letter are the same accounting standards that we communicate with you, which may affect the future financials. So overall, those are the main points of the Urban Renewal Agency to present to you as well. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, so just so it's clear, as I know we have some new um, counselors that are on um, the city contract. So this is a third, I guess you'd call it like a third party, third party auditor that basically comes in and looks at everything and makes sure that they 
uh, re are reporting out from everything that I am hearing um, that it is a clean audit and no discrepancies found. Is, is a fair statement. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, they are uh, independent auditors who uh, we engage to come and audit our financial statements. Um, and so you don't have Uncle Bob telling you everything's a okay. <laughs> and I assume. Can I? Assume? Yes, please. Yes. I assume um, that at the end of each letter there were a few a few deficiencies. I assume that those are corrected or, or analyzed or something like that. I, you know, just a few things didn't sum up and that was in the city's one. Uh, in the urban renewal, there was more <laughs> suggestion, oh, about how far the reconciliation. Yeah, so we, we do um, follow up on any um, audit findings and make sure that those controls are filled and functioning properly. Um, in fact, I believe that next year, the auditors would come back and relook at those to make sure that okay. they're functioning. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, we were playing catch up on uh, bank reconciliations and that was um, at the heart of one of those. Those are, are yes. caught up now yes. and um, that process is is fixed. So is that, so what I'm hearing is when we list, when one, a year that something is listed as something to correct or something to look into the following year that same auditing group will go over those is that correct i would expect that they would look at those yeah. to see that they've been corrected yes yes we will definitely we're required by auditing standards too so we'll definitely look into those Not private, huh? <laughs> any other questions thank you okay then so tomorrow night we can vote as a council if we want to adopt the findings for the so um, you basically just simply accept um, our re review. There's not actually a motion to accept. It's actually a presentation. You actually engage this auditor as your auditor. So um, uh, they are presenting to you their findings, mm -hmm. uh, which is contractually complete. And so um, uh, with the audit present presented to the governing body, um, staff will then uh, put it online for public consumption. Um, to follow up on the one thing that uh, Councillor Jones said, there are a couple things in there that you'll see in every audit every year um, because it's the size of our city and the size of our staff. And so, yes, uh, some of the internal controls when you only have three people in finance, um, there's no way to have. So you put checks and balances in place. Um, there's also um, fraud uh, surveys that are done by the council and also um, uh, the management staff. Um, uh, the uh, one issue on reconciliation of um, uh, bank statements, um, well documented that was going on, but there was not a paper trail to show it. And so we're making sure that um, that's corrected um, and uh, it is in place. So um, always good to get the feedback and try to make sure that you're crossing every T and dotting every I. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for your time thank and you. thank you to thank you. Um, the auditors. All right. Thank you. And everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Number six on the agenda is the council vacancy application process. We have some information um, in our packets from page 39 to 58. Um, so I will go ahead and ask our city recorder to come forward. And we had assigned her some homework um, to find out what some of the other processes were and sample questions and so forth. And so it looks like she's got a some information to present to us. I do. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. What you have before you in your packet from pages 39 to 58 um, is a collective council vacancy questions packet. Uh, these are responses from nine other cities. Um, so at this time, it's up to the council to come to a consensus on what questions, uh, format, time frame, or an application packet to be finalized and brought back to a future meeting for presentation and approval. So, Madam Mayor? Yes, I'm. Um, in light of the time, um, what I would suggest is that the governing body has the packet. Mm -hmm. uh, you have one counselor who was online who is traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think that it would behoove the council to sort of go through those sections and basically circle any questions that you want in bring it back to me 
Um, uh, we'll compile those. Excellent idea. Um, and then try to put forth um, the consensus of the gun and green body. And then let you know if there was any outliers, meaning, yeah. you know, uh, if there's uh, three or more, um, basically we'll put it as a question and then the governing body will have final say on the final application. Yeah. So we can call. hunt pick, right? Yes. We don't yes. have to yes. take the city of Milwaukee. We can take one yes. of theirs and somebody. Okay. Yes. You can take any question and, and feel free to go through, highlight that and then get it back to me and then we'll work to to compile the consensus yeah. Yeah. into a unified document and then at your next meeting you'll go through that document and say yeah let's go ahead and strike this question or we're okay with it or we want to add another question or something yeah, so like not tomorrow though well no. not tomorrow no because um uh, it'll be at your next meeting so and, when or when would you like the document back yeah, from the council? Yeah. Um, I, so I happen to know that the majority of the council is uh, leaving town on the twenty fourth, mm -hmm. and so um, and so I would say that, and then I'm going on vacation. Um, so as long as it's back to um, uh, here at City Hall, you know, before uh, uh, close of business on Friday, that would be great. Okay, but so, it's not going to kill us if it's not. Gotcha. Okay. And so I imagine taking this document, crossing out the ones you don't like, you know, certainly ones like having our city recorder compile those back together and coming back with us one more time with like, how does this look? And then we can make a decision if we think it's too long or straight. Yeah, I think it can be a combination. Yeah, I think it can be uh, that simple. I don't think it's got to be four pages long. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be. You know, 10 to 15 questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Did you have another so, question, Councilor Jones? Oh, I was just thinking, like, can we, can I skip the context stuff? Obviously, we're going to need to know their context. <laughs> you know, just yeah. as like a yep. star. Mm -hmm. I can like, add all that in. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Question from Councilor Norda. I heard just through the grapevine that the policy had been, or what had been done in the past, was to take the person who got the next highest number of votes in a previous election. And I guess that's what had been done in the past. So this is definitely a departure from that. And I just, I don't there know how been... many people were aware of that, so, but that's how yeah. it had so, been done. So Madam Mayor, if yeah. I may, mm -hmm. whether this governing body realizes it is one of your options is to do nothing. You're allowed to keep that position open. That's number one. Number two is, as a governing body per your charter, you get to decide as a governing body how you're going to fill it. So past precedents means nothing. The third is, is that you can take that process and say, hey, whoever was the previous. And I will tell you that going back, it's been a mixed bag as to what they have done mm -hmm. and haven't in other governing bodies. It's really... You know, in fact, I will tell you that Coos Bay has an opening, and I will tell you that in talking to their city manager, what's important to their governing body is that they find someone that keeps their goals moving forward so that they don't actually go a different direction because they've invested. And so at the end of the day, it's the governing body. And so in this case, the governing body has said to staff, this is the way we want to fill it which is that, that, that they want to um, have uh, the questionnaire done, which staff has started on. We'll bring that back to you. Once you decide on that, we're going to advertise, and then you all will choose um, how to move forward on interviews um, and facilitating uh, the timetable um, for filling it. So I understand what may have occurred, but your charter is very clear um, and state law is very clear, and you have your city attorney to to inquire if you want to, but past practice means nothing in filling the vacancy. The charter trumps. So. Okay. All right. Well, I think we have our homework. And um, oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Schultz. So, did you hand. Have a Friday at April 21st? If you can. If, if you can, or or. But I know some of you are going out of town on the 24th, so even if it's a week from Friday, it's not going to kill us as long as we have them by the end of the month. Yeah, I just appreciate yeah. this because yes. we didn't ask her to do this because that's the yeah. way we're yes. edited, mm -hmm. so I appreciate yes. that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. We have a thank plan you. to move forward, so thank you. Thanks, Macy.
Okay, so that was collective council vacancy questions. Number seven on the agenda tonight is the camping ordinance discussion. Um, so after our last meeting, um, I see our city planner is coming up. Um, we had some discussions about some potential streets that we thought might work out. Um, and it looks like our city planner has made us a nice big map, this one here, with a list of those potential streets. I don't want to cheat him out of credit. Our city uh, engineer actually uh, okay. <laughs> developed the map for you. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, give, have you give us an update on what you did or the engineer did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so Madam Mayor, members of the council, um, you know, you've got a map in front of you um, that just took the, um, you know, proposals and suggestions from the last uh, work session and put it onto a map so it's easier to visualize for you. Um, and there was, um, I passed out before the meeting, um, another little packet there of some um, withdrawals and additions um, to these suggestions. Um, and those were sent in as um, comments from various counselors and um, our mayor. Um, and so did you want me to go through those suggestions or? Um, yes, like what, yes, okay. let's go ahead and do that. So um, one council member um, asked to take out the library parking lot option. Um, and this is in response to um, a librarian um, providing some, you know, resources and precedent um, for libraries being used as a camping spot. Um, and so one counselor asked to, to remove the parking lot. Um, another counselor um, made their, kind of ranked their choices um, and broke it into non-vehicle and vehicular camping. And so their choices for non-vehicle camping were Harbor Avenue, and um, Pitham Loop, as long as the operational costs are not too great. And then for their vehicle camping areas, um, they selected the fence lot of Virginia McPherson and parking spaces around City Hall. And um, let's see, yeah. Um, another um, member asked to withdraw the fence lot at the corner of Virginia and McPherson. Um, so that leaves it at three, um, three people for that option. And then another counselor uh, provided a map with some updates, um, which include overnight camping allowed on Marion Street uh, near the mall and across Virginia to the north. Um, Sheridan Avenue between what appears to be Washington and Montana, uh, Union Street north of Grant Circle, Grant Circle itself, the 18 and 1900 block of Hamilton, uh, the Newmark property that uh, you guys went on your field trip to, and then uh, removing the RT zone from the ordinance, um, which is, you know, totally will of the council there. And so th those are all the additions and subtractions from the suggestions, um, which I know is kind of, I blew through that, but it's in front of you. If you have any questions, mm -hmm. definitely, you know. Okay, all right. So, um, well, what lays before us is some, I feel like we're getting closer and closer to coming up with a response to the house bill that is requiring the city of North Bend to allow sleeping, lying, sitting, few, uh, resting, um, for what we have to decide is a reasonable amount of time. Okay, I think we've had plenty of discussions that reasonable is probably gonna fall somewhere between eight and 12 hours. Um, it seems as a council that the time period is something that it hasn't been too hard for us to come up with. Um, people have suggested maybe 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. as late as 9 p.m., but I feel like those are still something that's really easy, you know, those, I think we'll get there on time. I'm not too concerned about time. Um, when we went through the ordinance last week and we talked about manner, um, those were pretty things that came up pretty easily too. I think we're all able to talk about, understand what the law is saying that you can and cannot do with an open flame. There didn't see anybody, any major discrepancies between the counselors of like what, what we see as manner 
and that the law um, that will be able to be um, stand up to what the the court cases are with where the law came and what those precedences are. Um, but then what we end up coming down to and why we're back here again at this diocese talking is the places. And so in preparation for um, tonight's meeting, I went back and I looked at the packet of all of the public comments that we've had um, reviewed of some of the, you know, we've had three town halls now over the last, um, over the last year. Um, and was just reminding myself through some notes of things that people have said. And the common theme that I have heard from most people um, that responded to those, because I'm also aware that there are plenty of people that don't say how that they feel, is that um, our residents do not want it near any sort of residential neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the map, this is why it's tricky, is because in our 2.2 square miles, it's very difficult to find any sort of land that's the furthest away. And I do understand why some of the counselors had suggested the Pitham Loop, because at a glance, it is the furthest from a residential, as opposed to if you looked at something at Newmark that is right across the street or um, some of the others. Um, but I also heard very loudly at our second town hall that residents did not want to give up one of our parks for camping. It was very clear. Um, and so tonight when we have this discussion, I really want to urge all of you to, as I mentioned last time, we need to start very small and do what is being asked of us of the law. And also, but be okay with the fact that we're not solving the homeless crisis here with this decision or tonight. And I think that it's important to know that I do feel like through things that this council have said, you do, uh, you do feel that there needs to be something done broader at a county level. We need a sobering center. We need a detox center. We need more affordable housing. Those are things that I think we can all agree that that need to be done countywide. And I'm really hopeful for the strategic plan and the new position of Andrew Brainer um, and working together. I I want to work closer with our commissioners. I feel like that the only thing that's going to help our county is if we all come together um, to work on a solution and we're not there yet. So when I say start small and let's do what is being asked of us of the law, because we also need, you know, we need to be financially responsible and not put us in a position where we're going to get sued and bankrupt the city. I don't want to do that. Um, but I want to see how some of these other things play out. And so I was, um, I think in one of the initial conversations last week, I think I said, you know, maybe, you know, maybe one of the positions off of, uh, or what, the empty lot off of Newmark. I, I was the one that took that off the map because another piece of the house bill is, I uh, was reminded that if we do tow an RV, the city of North Bend has to incur the cost and, tow, and, and secure that RV for 30 days. And that is the only lot that we would have to be able to do that right now. So that is one of the reasons why I took that. That is not something that we just want to do. This is legally what we have to do. And, um, and so I, what my suggestions is when you look at this mat, this isn't going to be the end all be all. I'd like to come up with three locations and, um, and then have us review this. It will go into effect as of July 1st and then review it again. And we can decide as a council what you think, maybe 60 or 90 days later, but yes. pick, yes, and yes. yes, but pick some of the things that, that are already available. So if, for example, what I will urge you guys to, uh, what I will urge our counselors to look at tonight is Harbor Boulevard would be a place where we could easily put up a dumpster and a bathroom if needed. Um, and it's a spot that is for farther away. Um, I know that um, another counselor or two had marked that that might be a good place for camping, like have people that are not in RVs, like camp in that parking lot. And then the other two places, if you have an RV or a car, we have that spot on 101 that says RV parking. It's already there. Have that be a second spot. And then the third area would be, and this is, I also stand by this, I like the idea of using spots either in the library parking lot um, or around and not during library hours. Remember, this is just to comply with the law. And maybe in those spots, 
we, the harbor could be seven at night, or actually I would rather that be like eight at night to eight in the morning, but maybe the library parking lot would be nine at night to make sure that we're clear of any activities to seven in the morning before anybody comes back in. We have the ability to say different times at different spots. And I also want to make sure that I was, to be honest, getting really uncomfortable with some of the language that we were using about like, you know, the naughty people can go here because I want to um, set a tone that I think everybody should follow the rules. And maybe we could sort of rebrand that and say, if you are somebody who is living in the car with a child that is going to school the next day and you aren't feeling safe, because remember, this is just, th these are crisis situations. This is not supposed to be permanent housing. This is a crisis, crisis situation that is one step up from sleeping under a tarp in the woods. And they're members of a lot. I don't know them. I don't know the exact numbers, but a lot are members of our own community. They aren't, they aren't important. Oh, yeah. But we, let's not have, we won't have that conversation right now, but they're humans. Okay. And we are providing a crisis situation. If there is somebody who's like, I don't really want to go camp down by the water. I have a child. We're going to school the next day, whatever it may be. Then we could use those sort of family, let's call it family oriented spots could be something that feels a little safer around the library parking lot, the, maybe even the fire department, if there's some spaces, you know, in that back parking lot, or at least the streets around it, those would kind of be my settings. So I see Councilor Gall is ready to say something. So let's do this. We, um, we have this room for another hour. We still have to um, go through the city council meeting. We don't have to solve everything tonight, but we need to get a little bit closer. Would it be fair to all of you to give each of you a couple minutes so that we can stay on track to kind of go down and we can start with Councilor Gall and kind of, I got to say, you know, my, my two cents here. I see our city planner is taking notes, but that's really where I land. And I, I will tell you, I would be really, I would not be able to sign off on an ordinance that includes the park. I, I couldn't. Well, I, okay. But, but, but try to convince me, right? Like let's, let's have a conversation. So I'm gonna go, I am gonna watch the clock a little bit just so it's fair. That everybody gets to speak. And so, Councillor Gall, um, let's go ahead and start with you. Well, all I wanted to say is that I didn't realize we were supposed to submit uh, a sheet back saying, well, let's not have it there, let's have it here. I thought we were going to have a conversation. So, my major conversation right now is that uh, for two reasons, I think parking the RVs along Highway 101. Downtown Sheridan, a block, and that's my first reason, a block away from this new um, uh, visitor information center that we're going to have. I think that's a bad idea. I think that that little RV parking for that half a block, the signs that are on it right now, I think was an intended for tourists. And I think we're trying to do this downtown, all this downtown stuff, and to take that away, I think, is a mistake. Okay, that's my first reason. My second reason is that our company owns that building you're going to be parking in front of, and plus uh, four other businesses in North Bend that pay a lot of taxes. And I would probably be, I ain't going to say I'm going to come out of this unemployed, but it ain't going to be good if, if that RV parking is on that block. So that's the two things I got to say. I, I understand what Jessica's saying about towing RVs and already having a uh, uh, spot to impound them. I, I, I get that. To me, that was my first pick, definitely for the homeless, because it was right there. It's all fenced. It's ready to go. You could be in there tomorrow if you had to be. So, uh, I, I, I'm very strong about that. Uh, you know, I happened to go to Harbor Avenue this morning and there's four cars parked there and two of them were on the boardwalk and the other two were just watching seagulls out in the bay. Uh, and, and I get that. I, I, you know, when I'm reading the signs down there, I hope that those signs don't mean that that's a park because there is city signs down there, but, uh, you know, everybody here, you know, I, I can bet you that two thirds of the people that voted for me to sit here don't want these homeless people even in our town. So I, 
nobody can, we can't make this perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got people saying not here, not there. And one of them was me just a minute ago. So uh, we we got to deal with it. What and, do you, and, are, you, yeah. are you, so you're, you, if I'm hearing you correctly though, you're seeing, because you worry about the impact of, which we all do, like we don't want to hurt our tourism economy, right. right? Like now remember though, we could set, we could even say, you can put your RV there, but it's 10 o'clock at night, the seven in the morning. You know, we do have some flexibility on time. But well, they... and we all see the the hassle in what it's going to be to enforce this. Yeah. Oh, everything we're talking about is going to be. Would you, uh, is is Harbor still on your list for the. Way Harbor? more than one okay. on one. What would the, what would the other second and third be? Well, I, I, if, if you're going Harbor, I would say I'm still, and I know, I know where the whole. I shouldn't say old folks home, but I know where the housing building is down here. You know, I used to play there before it was built. And I think we could keep uh, RVs on the 1900 block of, of Hamilton where it's the widest and nobody would be for the, nobody would be for harm. Uh, I, I, I think it's still close and Jessica's right. Let's keep this thing small. And in my opinion, keep it, halfway close to the police station because they're going to be on everybody's beck and call. So, uh, yeah, th okay. those are my, okay. is one's 19... a negative and two positives. Yeah. Okay. Is the 1900 block the gravel road? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And you kept that at four minutes. Good. So, Councilor Schultz. Um, well, I don't know if I have any... I, this is so complicated. And again, because we just have neighborhoods everywhere, mm -hmm. I always think that everything touches everybody else. So like, otherwise we would have already solved this problem. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think about all the time. Whereas I think about, it's not just like everyone is like, I work here or I live here or it's flat right by my house. And I think so, we're going to have to end up doing that. And it's going to affect all of us because we have to pick a place and our town is tiny. And so again, I, I know that where I live is, is close to downtown. And so again, I'm going to accept this because we have to make choices. And so that's what everyone is going to, have to think about is that that in the end, we have to figure out a place and we have to figure out why. My one question with the 101 RV parking is I feel like that no one parks there. So I, I just don't see it very often. And so I didn't know if because of the merging, if that's the issue. But but looking at where when I drive by, I'm like, that's not where people are choosing necessarily to park. What is the history? of? Because I honestly hadn't realized that that was RV parking. And so we started talking about that. Has that been there long? The where it's the, the white with the green sign that says RV parking and and I normally I would prefer to Ralph but do you, our, I see our city planner shaking his head is it do you have, he's, he's out yeah. okay does it maybe Captain no really okay and do you do you find are some of the dilapidated RVs that we're finding around town uh, or people like are you finding those RVs using that spot yeah very hmm. very seldom because right now it's Pretty much fair game, right? Well, and, and, uh, and once you regulate, right, I think yeah. it'll be a different thing. You know, there's a, a uh, tremendous amount of traffic going by there. Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess if a guy really is living in that RV and needs a good night's sleep, and it probably ain't gonna happen. Now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I know. Um, I think it was this weekend. Um, a tractor trailer with with wood was was parked there. Um, I will say, Coos Bay has deliberately kept folks off of 101 as well um it's your main corridor it's it's, it's it's just so hard because it's the it's it's like residential you know yeah. or affecting the restaurants yeah. and the tourism but remember um keep the keep the we can we can talk about time too like mm -hmm. you know i i i see we also have our fire chief <laughs> has hand uh got the red and black jacket on did you have a comment on the And I think it had something to do with when we developed the city parking lot, because right on that same block, there's a city free parking city sign that goes into 
you know, by the mural. And yeah. and we've developed that as parking. And I think that a lot of that happened at the same period of time. Yeah. So let's let's go ahead and, and Councilor Schultz, did you, yeah. you have a couple Sorry. more minutes yeah. on your timer here if you want to finish your... <laughs> well, people interrupted me. Sorry, yes. I, I, and I, 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 stole my I stopped your timer. Did I stopped you want, your timer. I don't have the map here. Okay. So, so you, yeah, so continue. I do, again, I just think that we have to think about nighttime. And so again, and I don't want to think, I don't want to predict that they're not going to move. So I'm making the prediction that we we choose the time, the RVs are there, and then they're gone in the morning. So that's I like to believe that they will be leaving yes. at, at the, yes. the time. So and we have we have our our commitment that. from our police department and our um and our resource officers that that's in code enforcement that that they will do what they can mm -hmm. to. Yeah, I guess I have people to know that the, the towing person. like if we have to tow them, we have to tow them somewhere, yeah. and, and so we that, have that, to. That, the place that has the fencing is where we would have to tow it. We would tow them. We have okay. to keep their belongings and the RV for 30 days at the cost of the city of North Bend. Okay. And is that the 885 Virginia vacant lot? Is Big that... lot 885 Virginia? McPherson yeah. in Virginia? Yeah. Yes. That's the URA lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was, yeah. I like that spot, but now I don't like that spot. Right. I just found that that otherwise, we would have to lease a spot somewhere to secure somebody's yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So that just blew one of mine. Okay. Um, but again, and then I do think that Harbor Avenue parking is potential. So that's one of my potential still until someone comes and convinces yeah. me why I that's think... not a good spot. Um, and then I go back again. I see the parking that's kind of downtown already by the library mm -hmm. early on, some of the offshoots around. And again, I don't want to, I don't like it, but I do feel like it's downtown is an area where there is a little bit less residential and we and you know i want to make sure that we're being fair i do know that there's residential in that area and i yeah. think what our job is to figure out how to have like the least impact but there is still residential in yeah. the area but it's you also have very close mm -hmm. to our police department and fire department which is important to me in, in this yeah and there are some wider streets over there as well mm -hmm. So, so if you were to give us the top three, because we are really, we are getting down to crunch time. And well, you took one of mine away, so now I, I don't know. know. So <laughs> Harbor. Harbor is one. Mm -hmm. uh, potentially around City Hall is okay. another. The Grant Circle parking. And then I have no third. Okay. Maybe we start with two. Well, I had it there, but then it just got off. So I know. Think but that. yes, this is again. This is where is this where we reach back out to our county commissioners and say, "Help us work with the state law. We need a regional approach." You know, yeah. there are things it's that we have to do the work bit. I know one at least one. Yeah, but yeah. but again, the Hamilton just look. I don't like a gravel road. I don't like a gravel. So so harbor and the streets around City Hall is what you're coming up with right now yeah. and did Councillor Gall make a did his plea of highway 101 speak to you yes he did okay he convinced I him. like her yeah <laughs> <laughs> um okay. well, it's also been one then we talked about these Bay City like 101 but that's people it, driving through our town and what they see at night so yeah. we're not okay well we won't we'll get to that later but we're not we're not saying take down the there's a sign so there's things that are happening right now and yeah. that's one of them there's a sign there that People, you're just saying not don't expand it. Yeah, just let it be for what it is yeah. right now. Well, I don't think it's 24 hour parking. Yeah, there's another there's something on there. Is. Okay, we might need to review what it yeah. says right now. Um, okay, any other thoughts before I move on to Councillor Nordoff? No. Okay, Councillor Nordoff, I'm gonna reset All right. my little I timer would, here. I would opt to scratch the any any pos possible parking at the library and instead use the city parking lot off between Sherman and Sheridan, north of Virginia. The city parking lot. The city parking lot, the, there's was a Chinese, now it's Mexican restaurant, and then the Odd Fellows building. So the parking lot for all the downtown businesses and the restaurants? Well, they're there. not necessarily there at night. It's a huge parking lot. I, I would, in okay. fact- I do uh, see our city administrators raising his hand. Let's see if he's got right. a comment. So Let, all I'll, parking, I'll come back to you. Yes, I, I said I'd come back with him. Sorry. Councilor Nordoff, go ahead and continue. I'm patient. Go ahead. Go. No, no, it's you. Patient. It's you. I got you. Got the floor. Go ahead. I said right. I'd come back to him and scrap, scrap the one at the library. Scrap the one at Grand Circle because you have the California Street Apartments 
there's, I don't know how many, six or so apartments there. They need parking. There's a single family residential north of the Trim Auto Body Place. They need parking. And I think with a roundabout, it's dicey anyway for parking. You have to be careful. And it's kind of a logistics nightmare to pull an RV in there for some instance. I think that RVs are easily accommodated along Sheridan and along Harbor. And I would opt for Hamilton because it's pretty hidden for being close to Virginia. So I'm hearing you say Harbor, Hamilton, and what was the other one? Um, Sheridan. The where um, Councillor Gall was talking about with the where the RV parking is already? Yes, RV parking there because it's easy to pull over from um, northbound Sheridan and it's easy to get back in traffic and move somewhere else. Now, I, uh, like Pat, did not realize that we were supposed to get back to you. And I we weren't. I think, no, nope, that wasn't an ask. What it was is just after the meeting, some people so, thought about it and emailed I back. Did not, I did not respond. Yeah. I, I, it went over my head and I apologize. There was no ask. I didn't weigh in a couple weeks ago. There was, there was so, no ask. Okay. So that's so, kind of where I'm at okay. with it. Um, I keeping, think, keeping I, the camping anarchy village. North don't use that word. Bridge, don't, yeah. Everybody's going to follow the rules. And then the little, you know, the enclosed parking lot there south of Virginia. Say that about the enclosed parking lot south the, of Virginia? The tent camping at the lot that we acquired when we bought the Coos County annex. So we were just talking about how um, if we have to acquire somebody's RV, say we have to tow RV, we have to store it in a secured location for 30 days. Can we store it there? Um, and so, yes. And so that's why I think some of us were saying maybe we need to take that off the list. Otherwise, now we have to like lease a spot yeah. for that, towing. for towing. Yeah. I personally do not think we're going to see a lot of people tent camping, volunteer to come in to a pretty, um, I, I it, it might be intimidating for people who are used to camping out in the woods to tent camping in a gravel parking lot surrounded by fencing with people from McPherson looking in and people from Virginia looking in. I personally do not think we're going to get a lot of people coming in unless there were some other, like, um, in fact, I was discussing this with a friend and she was saying, well, why don't you provide places for people to store their stuff so they don't have to pack it around in the grocery cart? And I, I, my, my point to her was, you know, we don't necessarily have the money to purchase it or to operate that kind of a, of a little check-in, check-out system. Mm -hmm. So if we had to do away with tent camping there in order to park RVs there, and uh, that might be that might be a, the better option. I was told this weekend that the register guard on Sunday had a huge article about impounding of RVs that I've been asked to go read, and I will as soon as I finish my taxes. But um, I think that that's that's a possible place to, if if we needed an impound lot. I think it's marginal for tent camping. I think um counts uh, sorry, um our city planner has a question. Or oh it was you were just were you confirming her? I, it was an itch. Oh, oh, it was just an itch. Okay. Just an itch. Um did you have a comment? <laughs> city Mr. I think was raising his hand when we were talking about the parking for the restaurants and the shops downtown. Yes, I did. It's a good thing we're not at an auction because he would have just bought that house. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah. So the um, it's it's important that the council knows that the parking lot next to the Mexican former Chinese restaurant is not fully owned by the city of North Bend. Uh, the state of Oregon Department of Corrections owns a good portion around their building of a lot, and then. The Goodfellows, you have an agreement with them because those spaces for them. Okay. And so we own some of that parking lot. And then the URA bought the section closest to the Mexican restaurant last yes. year. Um, 
and I think I understand from, from the fire chief, he's probably correct, that that particular lot's not even conducive for RVs to drive in and turn around, which is probably kind of why that got designated out there. Um, and so I was simply raising my hand to iterate that you can't really designate something that you don't own because it's not public. And so that so basically you would take away any parking spaces for anyone coming doing business downtown that can't park on the street um, in the limited spaces that you actually control there, if you will. You don't control that whole lot. And so and then I was trying to clarify one thing on the park so that you know, because I don't, I'm hoping not to get too much inconsistency, um, but the parks are closed from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, uh, some say dust to dawn, some are posted from 10, you know, Ralph says 10 to 7 a.m., the parks department says 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., um, and I tried to look at it consistently, um, is that um, it's, it's important that the public knows that this is the resting. There's nothing in the law that stops them in the morning to get in there and drive and go park in a park right. because it is day use by the law. Unless you specifically post it, no RV or no camping or something. And, and so again, that's an act. You regulate parking. Um, here, for instance, around City Hall, in areas you have already established parking so that can get changed by the will of the governing body so we just work through all of that um but yeah they can go out and park elsewhere in the city during the I, day i think that's why it's so important that we really talk about how to work with our state representatives and our commissioners because we can come up with this ordinance and say, here's where you can sleep and lie that we're being held accountable to do. But unless we come up with this, eventually this broader solution, we're going to, you know, individuals don't have a place to go if our, you know, officers are knocking on the door saying, okay, it's 7 a.m. This part is over. You need to move on. We're going to have individuals yeah. hanging out in the parks all day long yeah. that families aren't going to want. Yeah. So like, we're, we, you know, I, so there's clearly like, a lot of moving parts and a bigger solution. And I think what we need to focus on is we have some legal obligations that we need to do as a city to create these sleeping spots. And I'm starting to hear that we might only have one or two that we're going to be, be able to agree on as a council. Because yes. I do think it's important that we are as a team and we have a consensus here with this. And if that means that we're starting out even smaller than three, we might have to do that. Um, now, I just so I make sure I hear Councillor Nordoff correctly, like, so you understand why we couldn't use the, the parking lot downtown. Yes. The city doesn't know that. And why some of us were like, okay, we can't use, I, I do anticipate that we're going to be towing some RVs and where you need to then again, another legal liability that we have is yeah. to tow them. So that's why that parking lot in Virginia wouldn't work. So um, am I hearing you that you still think Harbor, whether we decide camping or RVs, you know, camper or tent camping or RVs, and some streets around the city hall. Maybe not, I'm not sure if I understand correctly why the, the counselors are not okay with the parking lot at the library from nine at night to seven in the morning, but they're okay with the streets around the library. I don't know. If the, we, the, the, the parking lot maybe, might be easier to regulate. I know that the our, our librarian came out against it. I saw that memo. I. I think maybe the fire department parking lot might be preferable. I, I know that she was against it and and that kind of I heard her her say that. Does she want I, I do think that, we have the library director on here and I I know she's probably not prepared to speak tonight um to that, but um to the Haley, this would be your chance if you wanted to say something. I hear Councillor Nordoff mentioning your name, so I want to give you the opportunity to speak. If you're able to hear us, here she is. We even see her lovely face. <laughs> Hello. Um, are you all able to hear me? 
Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for um, inviting me to share my thoughts on um, using the library as a designated spot. I think that um, similar to the situation you've described with the parks where you would have individuals who um, came and stayed for the night, they would remain throughout the day in the library's parking lot. Um, and they would have the right to do so because it's very likely that they would be utilizing library services, um, but you would not have the desired turnover um, that you would expect um, from someone, I think that you intend to have with the ordinance in place. Um, I think that if we had individuals who were resting in their vehicles along the parking on Union Street and the angled parking spots, um, I know of several individuals who actually do already stay there overnight um, and on Connecticut Street um, in a similar way. Um, there are RVs that stay there, um, but because they are subject to the daytime parking rules, they do move their vehicles regularly and don't create a nuisance. Um, and so I think my primary concern with designating the lot um, would be that um, individuals would come and stay the night, but then they would also stay throughout the day um, because they would on some varying level or degree would be accessing library services, which we want them to do. They need those services and we're happy to provide them. That's our purpose. Um, but we wouldn't have the rotation of people through the parking lot that we would desire um, when it comes to a camping ordinance. Yeah. Yes, I, I think it. So you're okay with the streets in front of the library, yes. but just not in the parking lot. That's correct. Because people are not going to tend to linger as much, or at least not, it wouldn't, they not, could not allowing camping yeah. in the library parking lot would then prevent it from being a deterrent to the well, it's not, other people yeah. using the library. Remember, That's it's fine. not camping. It's like it's we're creating basically sleep sites for the ordinance. So just in theory, somebody could park in front of the parking lot and then be notified by the community resource officer or um, it to say, OK, it's you can't park here anymore that time is over and then they could just move their vehicle to the library parking lot yeah. immediately. Yes. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, are we just moving the problem from this angle to this angle? I think it would be a mistake to allow overnight parking in the, in the library parking lot. But you're okay the with the streets in front said. of it. Yeah. Yes, I'm okay. fine with that. And then you, but did you mention Hamilton too? Sorry. I think, did you mention Hamilton or did you? You were saying you Hamilton. Hamilton. Um, Sorry. It's, it's, I thought you mentioned fairly it. well hidden. It's accessible. It's it's near the population centers. It's not in a residential area per se. So the what is it? The nineteen hundred block of Hamilton, the eighteen and the nineteen hundred block of Hamilton. And it's just how close would you say it is to the center, the apartment complex that the gentleman spoke from tonight? Is that is, a, is that a senior, senior center? Is he in the senior center housing? It's it's just a house. and housing. Hamilton. Senior housing. Do you know yeah, he is there, Larry. It's, his name is Larry. Yes. Well, maybe just the one block of Hamilton that's, that's in back of the the street right, uh, that's street division. Pardon me. That's kind of what I would suggest. Yeah. After in, in other words, you have you have Mid Columbia bus. Then south of that, you have the the um, the street department, the road department, Al Ghuli's compound. So perhaps just in back of and is that the 1900 or the 2000 block? 19. The one in back of the streets. That's 19. Okay, so just the 1900 block then. Keep it away from mid-Columbia bus. Okay. All right, I'm going to um, move to Councillor Jones here. What were um, your thoughts? Wait for you to hit me. I am. <laughs> okay, good. So, so to me, the most important thing we can do for this is to keep it moving. Mm -hmm. And there's a real easy path if we, for example, in the library, allow them to sit in the library and allow them to use services in the library, that becomes an established campsite. There's, that triggers a whole set of other things that are cost to the city. We don't need to do that. We don't have to do that. We also have to recognize that people are camping here, right? So Pit and Loop has already got lots and lots of people in there, I guess. I mean, yeah, right? We, that, you know, public works, police, 
fire, we, we know where people are camping. Um, and so to me, the benefit of the ordinance, even in these places where we don't want things, is that that allows us to say, keep it moving. We, we if our, that allows our law enforcement to go to these locations and say, time's up, keep it moving. And that makes it harder to stay, mm -hmm. right? That, I don't want to move around, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes it more interesting to say, well, maybe, maybe I go for some services. Oh, well, you know, maybe I try to figure something out. Mm -hmm. But when you establish, you know, I've been deep in the woods back and um, run into people's beautiful, interesting little hobbit-like camps they have there, right? They're there because it's easy for them to be there now. They've built it up. That's what keeping keep it moving uh, changes. It changes the dynamic for what we can do. So that's what I think. Now here are my choices. Yeah. I think we need to reserve the 885 Virginia as a tow lot. Okay. You don't want to tow these broken down things for 18 miles. Yeah. That is not a vote. I am saying I agree that that's tow. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, I think that um, temporarily, even though this is, uh, I think we need to use the uh, annex parking lot for tent camping. Again, it's uncomfortable. There's lights. We find something that's better suited if you don't like it. But we can't use that forever because that is in our urban renewal district. I don't even think we could use it right now. Right. We can't even use it right now because we purchased it to remove blights. So we so would we have- can't use even though that's that plan. Not at this particular moment. There could be okay. a process where we could buy it back and do things no, and no, stop the development. Permanent. Yeah, okay. We don't have a developer. We don't have a timeline. If we review this in 60 days, okay. during the summer, which is where we'll have the highest population, I would imagine, right? In the nice months. That is absolutely temporary until we can build out something different. But aren't you just talking rotate. about the same lot? You're talking about the place to impound the. the... No, I, on my map here. She's talking about the actual annex parking lot. Yeah. On the other I, side. Is every year just looking Yeah. 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 Which yeah. one? Okay. I'm sorry. Um, um, continue. Go ahead and continue. Okay. Um, Harbor Ave, so oh, that would be these end tents. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the, uh, the northern portions of Hamilton that are as far away from the housing that's there as we can get on the gravel road. Um, and then as much of 101, may, maybe maybe that's enough, right? Right. We just like, start with that and we review it in 60 days because we're going to have more information. We'll probably have to add more. Those are my votes for now. So let's see if if my notes are as good as the city planner's notes here. Through the discussion of what you're hearing from everybody, the one area that I feel like we're all could agree on, which is still not how we want to use our waterfront and develop our community, but we know what we're being required by the law, and we know that there's a much broader solution that needs to be made. But what I'm hearing is that I feel like everybody is on agreement that we can use the Hamilton parking lot of some sort. And I'm that's that was the consensus that I heard. I felt like everybody felt like that is a harbor. I'm sorry, harbor, harbor. Yes. That we all that harbor could be used. Can we can we have it be mixed tents and RVs? Or is okay. So harbor, however that sorts itself out. And that some streets along the library, the police department, and the fire department way. RV. Are, yes. RV, no camping. Yeah. Only, yeah, only camping down on Harbor. Um, <clears throat> do now I'm going to ask directly the city administrator and the city planner and, and um, the staff. Could we start with an ordinance that small? Could we start with, I, I feel like those are, those are some things that I am hearing collectively as the, and then review it in 60 days. I mean, you're, the answer is yes. Um, because there's a provision that says if those all fill up in an emergency situation, the city administrator has authorization to designate other temporary locations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if it was all to fill up, because yeah, because we we I mean we have to we could put though. we could put uh, trailers and RVs across the street in the annex. You know, mm -hmm. the uh, um, coffee shop has three people parked there now, but there's three quarters of a block there from the city office or the school district office across the street in the annex because that's a block, you know, that could well, be mixed yeah. into your yeah. little giddy up there. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, 
And can we agree to a 60 day review? Yes, just, please. Just yes. Because I don't think we have to. I don't want why would city staff not? or any residents to just I, hang for yeah, a long period yeah. of time. And, and we know that the summer is going to see an influx. I put in my first deal that we turned in for homework that it, it had needed to be reviewed at least quarterly. Mm -hmm. You know, so I whatever day and period you want. Uh, perfect time yeah. because we will see um, more. And, weather. you know, other things to keep in mind. Everybody in Oregon is going through this right now. Everybody in Oregon is going to have July 1st. If we make the decision that we're going to start this small with this, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens across the state. Like, does that change? Like, will more people come here or are more people are like, it's a little bit less wet in Eugene. We're going to go there. We're going to go where resources are. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, keep it moving. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't, um, you know, like, the, the rainbow thing where they shoot at the people and the city. you know it's not something like that but keep it moving is an invitation to improve what's happening i don't like moving around this is this is this is yeah. making this already yeah. harder but i'm handed a resource sheet every time it happens yeah and you is know? is um so if if i if i could get a consensus from the council that in you know, we we come up with these a couple of these the harbor and a couple of these streets around you know the city hall area, and we create an ordinance that starts the you know we have to do the thirty days in June and then it's effective July first, and then make a commitment that we um, hear back from the staff and the fire department, the police department, and public works directors and the parks and see how it's going September first. Right, or, 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 or if there's a situation, or if, I wouldn't mind to be honest, like you know, 30. monthly updates on yes. how it's going. Yes. Our, our city staff is pretty good at keeping us informed, but to our city uh, planner, yes. Um, and just as a point of clarification, in the draft ordinance, the way that it's written right now, these places are designated by resolution, so they could change at the drop right. of a hat at the will of the council. Okay, great. So, yeah, the um. One thing that I want you to update in the ordinance is um, a hard effective date of July 1st. Um, go ahead and write that in because otherwise it's 30 days from effective. And so this way there's a hard um, implementation date of July 1st. And then um, and then uh, we need to make sure that we have clear direction on time because we have to get signs into production. Okay, right. Um, okay. I, I know we've had discussions about, you know, should it be at seven, you know, but if you have families, could we, I think that Harbor, because we have some downtown businesses and restaurants that we don't want to disturb, I really would like to start that at 9 p.m. Me too. And then the ones that are closer to the fire station and the police department and the library might be our more family oriented. Spots could be seven or eight. So I don't know if you have any feelings on that. No, I'm good with time. I don't really, yeah, you because know, I think it's going to be so hard to enforce. And like you say, there's going to be people on the move, you know, and how many times are you going to pick all your stuff up and leave, you know? It just makes But I do want to touch it. touch one thing. And, and, I, and I think it's great that you're picking streets around here, but I, I want to see you try to steer away from the fire department parking lot i yes i've been around that all my life well since they built it i watched it when i watched them build it i wasn't very old but anyway there's multiple times during the year that brownie's got you know a, a ventilation house there in the parking lot or jaws of life training on yes he's got shitty cars and, yes. but remember uh, not late at night not at not eight at night, night not no, but they stay there they sit there okay. those cars just just yeah. Try to try to get the At cross least street and the annex way better solution than yes. the fire department part. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. would there be then am I hearing a consensus um that nine o'clock down at harbor to seven in the morning? And then um the streets around the city hall area, eight o'clock at night to seven in the morning. Sure. Are I'm confused on street. Are you speaking of on Sheridan or are you speaking of Grant Circle? Or I would um I think that we've ruled out Sheridan on 101 from the what I was hearing from the consensus I, from the consensus. I, I'm in favor of Sheridan on well, I mean, yeah. well it's it, it's a public free. area, it's not well heavily used during the evening. Shit, it's 101. It's 101, 
Okay, so but people are passing PhD. through and they're doing 45. Trust me on that. So let me ask, so let me ask um Councillor Gall this. It's it is marked for RVs right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And just keep what we have. Mm -hmm. Just just not take down the sign. Oh no. I'm gonna explain it down. <laughs> well, we just have to figure out what that's we would means. have to be I don't know if it means the sign says RV parking, but maybe in the ordinance, yeah, though, the RV parking is between RV parking and RV, RV sleeping in. You know, we're not supposed to have anybody sleeping in RVs in the city of North Bend. So yeah. we're we're trying to take care of that in this new ordinance, but that sign don't mean you just keg up there and sleep. It's just RV parking yeah. because um so Councillor Nordoff to answer your question, were I was I was going to have the staff come up with the draft of the streets that you know um would be the best around city hall. I don't know which way the you know police cars come out on a regular basis or the fire yeah. department you know, comes out on a regular basis. So they're going to be best to say it's this street and that street. And again, remember in 60 days, we can go back and expand this if we need to, or really less than 60 days because it's by a resolution, but starting with just Harbor and a few of those streets gets us going, yes. see how the rest of Oregon is yes. reacting to this as well. Yes. And, um, and then we, come back and go, oh, wow, we really do need to add in Hamilton, or we really do need to look at some other spots, or maybe uh, the law changes and we can have a regional solution and the county gives us a swath of land and we build a, a detox center and a compound and everything out in the county, right? Wouldn't that be great? Is that too much wishful thinking? Yeah. Are you are you wanting to keep the, um, the lot on McPherson that's in front of the Coos County Courthouse Annex? Or no, I would, parking? my suggestion for that, my suggestion for the staff is to come back with a, you know, a, an ordinance that says nine o'clock at night to seven in the morning for camping and RVs down at Harbor Street and uh, eight o'clock at night to seven in the morning on a few identified streets around the city hall area. Okay. Um, and I hear what you guys are saying about maybe not use the actual parking lots of the library or the police department yes. or the yes. fire department, not. but the streets the streets around them, just a few of the streets around them. Yes. I would like to speak again to Sheridan. It is three lanes wide. The traffic is traveling fast. It's not going to be yeah. a visual impact of RVs. And we're saying there. keep that there. It's easy for RVs to yeah. get in and get out. Yeah. It's a nightmare for RVs yeah. to access around City Hall. So, so yeah. we're saying keep the existing RV camping okay. that's happening there, okay. but maybe not add to it right RV now. RV parking. Ar RV parking. They're <laughs> not supposed to sleep right. there. I, it, words are important. I yeah. agree. Keep the RV parking there from eight at night. Maybe we do have to look at what it says right now because it might be any time, but we might need to tighten it up. Just, but see, this is why it's so important to come back and review this in 60 days because every action that we're making, I'm worried that we're driving everybody to hang out in the parks in the daytime. That's really what's happening. Kind of. Yeah. And then we have to address that. This is, you know, they call it the, the, mall? the, the yeah, private land. Well, but, yeah. I mean, you know, this is, we are, we are probably creating a lot of unintended consequences. For sure. I think we're really close. Okay. And I don't yeah. know when David really wants it. Is now, there something that we should talk about with Ralph to, on the 50 feet from the waterways? If we go Harbor, uh, I know depends on who's running the tape. I could probably get 51 feet from the water, but yeah. Um, the the concern is all sanitary. So no, I get it. You know, um, un, uh, when when non regulated, um, it's basically just opening it up and letting it flow, and so the brown water causes concern. So that's why that was written into the ordinance. Um, but again, it's still the the will of council. Um, that one was put in as an environmental protection um, oh, to yeah. the city and its waterways and our regulation. Um, but, but uh, I mean, the logical spot of Harbor is on the bay side. Mm -hmm. You've got a propane, on. big propane deal there. They're probably going to want to have open flame around. And, and then you got Angle's storage shed, you know. So, uh, yeah, the, the majority of what they're going to be able to use, and you've been down there, is on the bay side. So, yeah, if Ralph can go 40 feet, then we got a maze. So, 
Okay. And there would be then that's and then per the house bill, we have to provide a, a bathroom is what the law is telling us we have to do and a dumpster, correct? Or trash yeah, at well, the cost of the city. Yeah, we'll take care of, of that. That's not even an ordinance issue, but okay. um we'll go ahead and write this up. I anticipate because we've gotten one early on. Because if you recall, when you all started this process, no not you all collectively, <laughs> the governing body started this process with the first town hall. One of the first letters you got was from the general manager of Ingalls oh, yeah. because the trucks that come in there at very early hours of the day to get to their big warehouse. And so, um, so I anticipate that as we publicize, you'll get that. But but again, um, it's it's your public streets, your, your we, harbor. Since we have our captain here from the police department, can I ask him a question of like kind of what that would look like to, you know, is it good morning, everybody? It's time to like, so we create this ordinance, right? And we say you get to be there from nine o'clock at night to seven in the morning. Um, if the resource officer is not on staff, does would another police officer, if they're available, be able to go down and say okay uh good morning this like what does that look like what do you have a thought have you thought about it yet <laughs> and you can come forward if you like <laughs> yeah. if you like yeah because this is this is what the decisions that we're making tonight will impact your team and how it's enforced so i'd like to hear some thoughts that you have on it so Obviously, when the resource officer is on, that would be part of his job. On yeah. the weekends, I would not be able to guarantee that that would happen at seven o'clock in the morning, right. or whatever it is. It just simply staffing. It's going to be staffing, priority calls. Yeah, priority uh, calls. Yeah, and that's what we're going to. Is there really? Is there a time that works better shift change wise for you guys? I mean, I, I think your seven o'clock time would be okay because okay. the shifts right. change usually an hour before that. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to tell us? No, I mean, it. Uh, I, there's no perfect response to that question or or your, your process at all. And it's going to be an involving or evolving thing. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to do the best with the staff that we have. Do you, with like my reasoning of um, having trying to have things close to the police station and the fire station and the library and city services is that I've often thought, you know, there's, there's different groups of people that are experiencing homelessness or reasons why they need to camp in their car or whatever, you know? And so we, you know, we know that we're being told by the state to create these sleep sites. And I feel like if you have spots that are close to some of these services, people who maybe don't want to obey the rules or the laws might be more likely to move on then is kind of some of my process here is that we might be eliminating some of the stragglers. I, you know, and I, I hope that doesn't sound heartless because I know that there's all sorts of levels of people that are experiencing this and I want to help people who really need it. But also if there are people that don't want to apply, comply with the rules or the ordinances or the laws, then, um, then, then the North Bend is not a place for you. I think it's a, it's a good point and one of the things that kind of i spoke to before is that right now uh as weird as it may sound there aren't any rules mm -hmm. or not effective rules and this is a step in in the right direction whether or not somebody hands down a court decision later that says you can't enforce this ordinance i mean that's something we may end up dealing with later uh, mm -hmm. i think that the what to your question about the parking spots around city hall um it's kind of a it's a double-edged sword. I don't want my officers in the police department at all hours. I'd rather have them out and around. And I yeah. think that's what the constituents here, you know, our our community wants is for those officers to be in the True. neighborhoods and not there. Um, but it's a it's a centralized place. And the areas in which you talked about, you have them all in one general location. So as far as the officer that we have dedicated to that, it's definitely going to be a little bit of an easier manage for him mm -hmm. rather than uh, literally traveling every inch of the city right now dealing right. and reaching out to homeless in this different places. Yeah, and I mean, just like the just 
block across from the annex. You know, that's not residential. That's, you know, and park in front of the annex. Could we tear that down and build up some shopping center with a housing deal on top of it? Uh, I'd say it's a perfect spot. It, and there's a block and a half right there that we can put on your little map and and you know, and then the next question is is how do we how do we get this? Well, you guys talk to those guys every day. I was gonna say, how do we get these areas out to the public? But it'll 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 get taken care of. Yeah. Well, when this goes into effect, we'll start directing yeah. people yeah. to those. So areas. what this the whole point of all of this and what this will allow us, like how we have RVs that pile up at Safeway or pile up at Oak Street, we are now giving the police officers, you know, kind of the ability to say, you can't be here, but you can be here. You know, we couldn't, we wouldn't be, yes. we weren't able to say that before, correct? Because yes. of the way that the, the house bill came down is that right now camping is legal everywhere on public but Land. they can go there during the day. Yeah, it's uh, it's that <laughs> it's, it's that resting thing that you're talking about. I mean, that's right now it's defined as all public areas, your city owned areas. That's kind of what and we're coming back to those streets, areas, mm -hmm. those areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question for the captain? Is since we've got him right here in front of us. Okay. Do you feel like we have given the staff and the city planner, do you have enough to be able to come back with what you're hearing as a consensus from us? My only question, Madam Mayor, is are you guys okay with the manner as directed in the draft ordinance? Yeah, I don't think okay. that there was any issues with manner. Um, well, the only reason I brought record the 50 feet deal up, if that's, yeah. if that's set in stone, we might want to. And that's something I think that uh, Ralph and I can go out and measure and yeah. see what, what it, where it ends up. Tell him I'll hold the end of the table. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So again, can you remind us of the process then where we're at with this? Yeah. So at your next meeting, which will be your first meeting in May. Okay. You will be given an ordinance for consideration. You'll talk about it at your work session, and then you'll be asked to vote on it. If there is one person that dissents or more, it will then go to a second meeting, which is why we're doing it one, two. That second meeting, if it's adopted, it'll then go into implementation with an effective date of July 1st. Okay. And, and then staff. Um, it doesn't have to be unanimous. We would just need a majority of four to vote. Yes, yeah. but if you do not on a, in order to pass an ordinance with first reading, second reading without engrossing the whole thing if you have someone that's a dissent it goes that's why your council is back on this agenda because you had one person um dissent on it so you have to go back through and hear it at a second meeting okay so it just takes up more bandwidth is all but okay. that's your process yeah. um okay and all right all right because Larry's not. Here. I think we've. And I yeah. We're, we're close. Yeah. I think when we heard from Larry, uh, Councillor Garbo, the other night, it was, I know that he was speaking about some of the similar things. I don't think we're too far off from what we oh. are. I just, I kicked the, I just kicked the computer system. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to stand up because I um, broke something here. But we have long, long leg. So, um, then we do have a few other items on the agenda tonight. We have our, um, we need to review the city council um, agenda for tomorrow and the urban renewal agency. I'm gonna ask our city administrator to walk um, us through those. Thank you, city recorder for fixing that. And yeah, um, nine minutes because I see our planning, planning commission has a meeting in here tonight. So, so uh, yeah. your first is your national uh, volunteer week proclamation and we have how many people invited with certificates? Almost 90. About 90, 90 people. 90 folks. Do, do we want to look at, I can call the meeting to order. Will they all 90 be able to fit in this room? Well, or it depends how many of our SVP, okay. but in the past we did a big, huge group photo out on the steps. So I don't know what the weather report right now is for tomorrow. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll have, uh, I think we had rain all week, but we'll have uh, certificates for them uh, in order to get them uh, recognized. 
So be prepared as soon as if we are in here and we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we'll go out for a photo, then we'll come back in. All right. Thank you. Um, we also have recognition of former uh, counselor uh, Eric Gleason. I say former. Um, Y'all voted to vacate. So um, and then you have your uh, minutes. And did Eric Gleason say that he would be able to be attended? Yeah, we actually called him. OK. <laughs> Okay. Um, you have your minutes from April 4th. Any issues, concerns? Because right now it's on the consent agenda. Okay. I don't have any issues. Was there anybody else that needed to remove anything from the minutes? Otherwise, we'll just keep it on the consent agenda. Okay. All right. You have your uh, standard housekeeping of your bills. Uh, OLCC renewals. This is annual housekeeping. Uh, so all those, we go through the list. Anyone that's not eligible is removed. And then this is our annual renewal. And then the state, you know, gets their fee. Uh, you'll see that um, uh, the Mother's Day Fair is coming. So this is um, uh, per um, our process. You authorize a public assembly and temporary use for public entertainment for Davis shows. And so this is actually getting to you ahead of the actual show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, Mother's Day um, Carnival. Always the Carnival. Day. And then last but not least, you have appointments. This would be a mayor's reckon mm -hmm. um, recommendation or appointment with confirmation. And so that is for the uh, Water Board uh, Budget Committee. And um, there's no staff recommendation for that, although I will say that your CFO um, has um, agreed uh, if uh, so fit uh, to be appointed. Um, but Madam Mayor, you would have to put forth um, one or two names uh, in order to um, appoint individuals to the budget committee for the water board. Um, they, I believe have two meetings and they also feed you lunch. Okay. Madam Mayor, yeah. should that be on the consent agenda? If the, there's going to be discussion and the the point the you're asking if it's on the consent agenda or should it be on the consent agenda? Should it be if there's going to be discussion and you're going to because that's it's kind of not a, as straightforward as the other normal stuff on the consent agenda. Um so item E is I will have appointments and if I wasn't ready for those appointments tomorrow. Would I just kick it to another meeting? Um, when are there budget committee meetings? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's it's on the consent agenda because it's the mayor's appointments, yeah, right? Yeah, you appoint and then it's a confirmation. So unless someone grossly objects with your appointment, okay. you're, you're the mayor, you get to make those appointments. Yeah. Um, so you would just seven, and like I said, you're more than welcome to you, you, one or two. Um, Jeff Bridgens, your um, finance director here, has agreed to serve. So, yeah, and I think that would be really appropriate to have our finance director on the budget committee. And so, if there's if, a council member, you can consider a council. Yeah, again, and they they for you. sure want two. Um, they or it's the, one or two. It's one or two. They so um so. So it is on the consent agenda. Agenda. I would like to tomorrow, um, unless there's any um, uh, hesitation, I would like to appoint our finance director to be on that tomorrow night. If you're okay with that, we can pull it from the consent agenda and we can have a discussion. Okay. Um, you're good with that, Councillor Jones. Yeah. Does anybody else have if or have our finance director on that budget committee? Okay. Would you like to have a discussion about that? Pull it. Councilor Nordoff, or are you okay with it? It shouldn't be on the consent agenda, in my opinion. Um, I have our attorney online. Do you want to make a, a comment about the, this questions on the, um, I'm going to make an appointment to the water board, and um, Councilor Nordoff was asking if that is okay to be on the consent agenda. Yeah, so thank you, Mayor. Um, you could leave it on there if, if Councilor Nordoff would like it pulled, then and we could do that as well. And, and that would allow for um, more discussion than is, than is uh, typically done during your consent uh, consent agenda. But we're not violating anything by having it on the consent agenda. We're not violating our charter. No, as long as it's clear as to who, who is going to be, who your uh, appointment would be. Okay. Well, it's not clear because on page four, it says, 
it, it's not clear who's going to be. So I, I just made an announcement that I'm going to appoint the finance so. director. So just to be clear, tomorrow evening, or that that appointment would be the finance director for the water board. And that that's the one appointment. Yes, and I'll just stick with the one appointment. Sure. Okay. Sure. And less, and if and I one last time, does anybody want to pull that from the consent agenda? And and I'm not hearing anything from <laughs> Councilor Nordoff, giving you the opportunity to pull it. Okay. Um. Thank you. All right, Madam Mayor, from there, uh, you would go into public comment. Folks have until one o'clock to sign up for online. Otherwise, they can be uh, sign up uh, in the lobby uh, ahead of the meeting. Okay. You then have Ordinance 2065. As I mentioned, there was one counselor who voted a nay. And so, per your um, uh, council rules, uh, that uh, and you charter your ordinance, it will come back. And so, you'll simply just go back. And we will um, uh, move that ordinance through for a vote. Um, you have then the Coos County Coordinated Office of Houselessness Strategic Plan. This would be accepting the plan as written. If you have any changes, that would be the time uh, to put forth. But otherwise, um, the ultimate goal is to have all three governing bodies uh, sign off on it um, so that the strategic plan can move forward as a unified document to the state of Oregon and the legislature. Number seven, Dunley Avenue uh, grade. Um, this is actually not a financial issue. It's actually staff time only, um, but there was a previous uh, grade change that was approved um, by the governing body, um, which is all great and dandy, except one grade affects, his, affects another grade. And so when um, uh, uh, they established the grade uh, to commercial um, for the sanitary sewer project, um, uh, it's not in perfect alignment for Donnelly. And so this is a um, request to uh, set the uh, Donnelly Avenue grade, and that will be done by ordinance. And so, uh, Madam Mayor, you have a script um, for uh, that to try uh, to accomplish that in one reading. Um, and then uh, action, if any, from executive sessions. There are no executive sessions, so there will be no action. Uh, there'll be the city administrator's report, uh, any committee reports, any council comments. Under other business, I believe we have one item um, which we are putting forth um, just under the hair here, um, <laughs> which is a fair housing resolution. Um, and this is a piece of housekeeping for the community development block grant that is in place because so much time has elapsed. Um, the state is asking that we go ahead and reauthorize a resolution. Um, as you're aware, you all move that from ORCA over to Neighbor uh, Works Umqua. Um, that process is moving smoothly and wonderfully, um, but they're crossing T's, dotting I's. And so most of what uh, I accomplished this weekend was um, clearing all of those uh, requests from the state. Um, and so this is a piece of housekeeping that has to come before the governing body. So we will add that with our 24 hours notice. It will be there under other business tomorrow. Okay. And then we would have the URA, URA meeting. Yes, and that is um, only the March 21st, uh, 2023 minutes. Um, and then an executive director report. There's no other action um, anticipated from the URA, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you. Okay, well, We'll go ahead and adjourn the work session and we'll